Um, and the reason for that is just because of the lack of opportunities that are presented for children in these areas. So for example, here in Orange County, um, soccer, football, baseball, or sports that are more prominent among the youth just because of the opportunities that they present. Um, and while they might not be the most abundant opportunities, just like uh, in comparison to like maybe Fredericksburg or just surrounding cities and counties, um, there's so much more opportunity than other sports like field hockey or volleyball, which are virtually non-existent until high school. Um, so for in my experience, I, um, I played soccer my whole life. I was lucky enough to always have the opportunity to play travel soccer for Orange Fire. But it was not until high school that I was able to play field hockey. And my teammates and I always say that we wish we could have played uh, field hockey our whole lives. So um, with this being said, I wanted to do uh, research a topic where I could implement the results of my research into an activity, just like the sports night that I had, where um, we could address the lack of opportunity by creating an opportunity. So this leads me into my research question, what are the best methods of inspiring youth sports in rural communities. And through my research, writing my paper, and working on my internship and community service, I found that the three best methods that parents and coaches can take are to um, understand their role in a child's development, two, to create a pressure-free environment, and three, to promote uh, just strong peer connections among the, the children on the team. And so with that being said, uh, I just want to give you all a quick uh, statistic to just ponder throughout the presentation, which is that only 21% of children in the US are meeting their daily recommendation of 60 minutes of physical activity. So that just goes to show exactly why we all need to begin prioritizing youth sports, encouraging them, and just addressing the lack of opportunity here and on a broader scale. So for, for my professional learning experience, I worked with Lori Mills and Jason Lohr. <laughs> who are the head coaches of Orange Fire's U10 uh, girls travel soccer team, who I work with as well. They are very experienced coaches who have worked with a variety of age groups at different levels. And under their supervision, I completed 20 and a half hours of service through the month of September to November. Um, they taught me just so much about managing a young group of children, especially having 10 of them at once. And at this age, they're very easily distracted and just overall, um, competitive so there's many issues that arise but with their leadership I was able to learn how to just solve these issues and work around them um, they also gave me many responsibilities and opportunities from just setting up drills to uh, participating in the drills to being the ref at um, in their scrimmage at the end of practice um, they also gave me other responsibilities that were a little bit bigger like being able to work with like maybe one half the team while they worked with the other as well as uh, just welcoming my input throughout the season. So other than the skills that they taught me, I was also able to gain very meaningful connections with the girls on the team. Uh, here you can see that I'm practicing with them, just showing them defensive tactics. And uh, here I'm just, once again, just doing some things to um, help in practice. Uh, so overall, I was just very grateful for the opportunity that I had to spend the season with them, as well as to um, just watch them go through the season, uh, watch how they progress individually and as a whole team. And I'm just extremely grateful once again that I got to spend the season with them. For my community service, I knew that I wanted to do something where I could implement everything I learned from my uh, professional learning experience, as well as reach an entire community rather than just uh, one sport, like only reaching soccer, or only reaching field hockey. So once I established that I wanted to do something like a youth sports night, I reached out to our athletic director, Ms. Dessa Stone, who um, then agreed to be my supervising adult. And under her supervision, I completed just about 15 hours of service starting back in August when I began to formulate the idea of what I wanted to do. Um, so with her help, we began to plan the event. Uh, it was originally supposed to be in the field house here, but different things just caused that to not work out. So we then reached out to Mr. Jack Rickett, one of our school board members, and he was very happy to provide a space. So once we established a time, a location, a date, we began working on this fire right here, which I sent out to everybody I could think of that could help me to promote the event, as well as I began to reach out to all the coaches here at the high school to have them come help uh, support and just reach all the kids in the community. Um, each of them brought along some athletes of their own. And here you can see some of my coaches um, with me. 
can see some players um, that came out and they just um, created a very, very good environment for the children to feel comfortable and come out and just try the different sports. There was lacrosse, there was field hockey, there was soccer and many more sports. And so basically the coaches kind of just sat back and were there to answer questions for the parents while the kids were able to make connections with the student athletes. So you can see here's like a picture and there they're playing soccer. And it just created um, an environment where the children could find a role model in the student athletes and um, also have leadership from the coaches. Um, overall, the night went so much better than I could have ever imagined. And I was so, so happy with it. I was very um, proud of myself for everything I did to make it happen. And I was proud of the opportunity I created for the children to try the new sport. And confidently, I can say that many more than just one student, which was my goal for one, to find a sport that they loved. I can confidently say many more than that found it just by walking around the building. You could see how happy all the kids were and how they were trying all these different sports. So I, all my goals were accomplished that night, and I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity that I had to create this event for them. And here you can see we did not discriminate based on age. This is my one-year-old niece playing soccer. And over there is just a, an image of the, the main gym of the kids playing sports. There was like seven sports in there. Um, as for my legacy, the impact I made on each of the children I met throughout the process is the contribution that I made. And uh, here you can see I am with my team at a tournament. So with them, I was able to pass on my knowledge of soccer as well as just teach them more about the sport from a different perspective. And on the right, you can see that's a picture with uh, the majority of the student athletes and coaches that uh, came out to my event. Um, they, were, uh, they were able to help me so much, and I hope that one of them will take over this, the reins of this in the future. So here are just two clips from the, the night, the other night. So in both videos, you can see Sarah and Jason Lohr's daughters who have always played soccer. And while I'm sure that they could excel at any sport they tried, this, these clips just go to show the opportunity that was presented for the children to try new sports. And I also just want to point out that in both videos, the person throwing the ball is Keller Hines. And this past fall season, she made history by being the first woman to play on the football team here in Orange County. So once again, that role model figure is present for the students. Um, as for my self-assessment, what I learned about myself through this whole process is that um, my dream of one day being a nurse practitioner working in pediatrics is achievable and that I do have what it takes to work with children, as I had doubted myself before. But now that I got to, to do this whole process working with the girls on the team, I know that I can achieve that goal. And if I were to go through this, this whole thing again, and uh, now that I've done it and I, I know what I would do differently is Basically, just that um, I would love to have toured the place where we held the event first, just so I could have a better idea of where to, to place all the different sports. But in the end, that, that really didn't matter. We, we made do with what we had. Everyone had a suitable place, and all the kids had fun regardless. Uh, to future governor school seniors, the only thing I would really say to you is um, just to maybe start thinking about what you want to do for your project early on so that you can either secure an internship over the summer, begin that internship, or at least have it set up to start in the fall, because that'll just take so much unnecessary stress off of you if you can get it done earlier. For my future, as at the moment, I'm not exactly sure where I'll be in the fall, but my top choice is UVA, uh, but no matter where I am, I'll go through their nursing program and then one day become a nurse practitioner. Questions? Sports night um, that you did. How many estimate? How many families? How many children uh, attended that night? Um, so I would say about fifty students and their families. So our promotion promotional tactics we used, I guess you could say, were were very successful, and I was very happy with how many kids showed up.
<clears throat> Read. Up next, Terry Kessner and moving the elderly. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carrie Kessner, and today I'm gonna to be sharing with you about my experience in exploring physical therapy and physical activity among the geriatric population. So my initial interest in physical therapy was sparked when my younger sister had to begin physical therapy. As a competing gymnast, she developed serious back pain and because of that, it inhibited her daily life, causing her a lot of pain. So she began doing physical therapy. I was inspired by her treatment and the way she progressed through it and how it impacted her positively, giving her relief from the pain that she had been experiencing, which led me to where I would complete my professional learning experience at Pinnacle Physical Therapy in Orange, Virginia. Here's an image of the interior of Pinnacle Physical Therapy where you can see some tables where patients would receive treatment. Here I would meet Dr. Cornette, physical therapist and doctor of physical therapy. He would agree to be my mentor and I would shadow him for a total of 15 hours and 30 minutes between September and December of 2023. Throughout my time observing, I was able to see a wide range of patient populations being treated and see all the different aspects of being a physical therapist and what it entailed. In the following two slides, you will see different um, activities and exercises being demonstrated. Both are being demonstrated by two other physical therapists who also work at Pinnacle that agreed to be demonstrators for my pictures. Um, here you can see he is warming up on a bike-like machine, which just gets the muscles warm, and many patients, when they're coming in for their regular treatment, will warm up here before going on to their actual physical therapy. In this image, you can see a demonstration of an exercise that would be implemented into a treatment plan. That's another thing I find super intriguing about physical therapy is the fact that it is patient-specific not one size fits all, different exercises will be prescribed to the patients depending on their specific issue that they're dealing with. This is an image of Jordan Robinson, who is a physical therapist and doctor of physical therapy, whom I completed my expert interview with. Her answers to my questions during the interview would aid me in coming to a consensus of my research question. My research question was, what are the best methods of positively encouraging 
physical therapy and promoting the bodily well-being of elderly people both in nursing homes and in general. Both her research and her answers to my questions alongside other research that I conducted myself through UVA's databases and other scholarly articles would lead me to discovering the three best methods of positively encouraging physical therapy and physical activity among the geriatric population, which were increasing availability or accessibility by either implementing programs, more funding, increasing staffing, various areas like nursing homes specifically, to make that more available and accessible. The second method was through making it more individual, giving patients specific plans, and allowing them to get what they specifically need for their bodily well-being and mobility needs. And the third method was through doing so in a positive manner, and motivation has been proven to be a leading contributor to progress. This would all lead me to where I would complete my community service. I was lucky enough to get a general basis of understanding of the geriatric population and physical activity within that, as well as physical therapy, which would be great going into Dogwood, being able to work with the residents. At Dogwood, I met Gail Collier, who was the activities director, and she was very helpful in helping me to coordinate my community service where I obtained 14 hours and 45 minutes of community service. She also pointed me to Dora, who was a nurse at Dogwood, who was in charge of conducting the Moving to the Music activity, which myself and a fellow classmate would come to be very involved in. Here I am pictured with my fellow classmate, Donovan Litz, who was doing his project on music, and I was doing my project on movement, so it worked perfectly for us to be able to collaborate, share ideas, and work together towards our volunteering. Together, we would both participate and lead the Moving to the Music activities, even contributing our own ideas, coming up with our own games to contribute to the activity. Overall, when volunteering, we witnessed so many smiling faces from the residents and laughter, and it was a very positive atmosphere, which I hope my impact would have been left with the improvements we made and the positive atmosphere we helped share. Oftentimes, because it was too music, we were doing movements, residents would choose an activity or an exercise to do, and then we'd all do it. Oftentimes, it was dancing or dance move or something or even daily activities, the simulation of daily activities to just get our bodies moving. Here you can see, this is another fun thing. This was an Elvis concert that the residents got to um, watch. And again here, like I was saying, many of the residents were moving, dancing, clapping along, which is just a very exciting experience for them. Very cool to watch. So through my impact of participating in and creating a positive atmosphere and kind of improving, adding new ideas to the physical activity aspect at Dogwood, I feel as though I left a legacy with the relationships I formed as well as the people that I touched. Um, I really wanted to focus specifically on the geriatric population with my research, my community service, because they are a less reached population, part of the population. And often they are the ones that, you know, may need extra motivation or encouragement in physical activity or even physical therapy and such. So overall, my entire project was a learning experience. Everything from obtaining my internship to meeting my mentor to um, uh, com coordinating my community service and um, communicating with my supervisor for that. Well, it's a learning experience and I will go on to use everything I learned throughout my future career, academically and professionally. Um, if I had to give advice to the future seniors, I would say start early. I wish I had started even earlier than I did over the summer. It's very important. Even getting your ideas flowing, reaching out for the first time. And um, I would also say truly pursue your interests and what you think you may like or want to do. You never know if, even if you're worried that someone may not contact you back, you never know until you reach out. Um, being able to 
um, work with a physical therapist really allowed me to expand my interest in physical therapy and determine that that may be a career I would like to pursue while simultaneously volunteering and positively contributing to my local community in the geriatric population. Um, as for my future plans, I plan to attend a four-year university, potentially UVA being my top choice, and pursuing a career in healthcare. Thank you. I would say that reaching out, finding a mentor was huge, and obtaining an internship, even the interview, every part of it, because these are all things, you know, in college, you'll go on, you'll be expected to do these things, so, and I'll just be able to carry my experiences with me and have a basis of knowledge for all of, yes, 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 coming more smoothly. Your mic doesn't match. Oh, well, you're talking on that. Does it match? Yeah, this, is, this is just so we're able to hear you. So it's not. It's not. But you don't have to talk into it on. You have to talk into it. Do you want to put this on you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the point. Next is Jackson Hamilton with Patient Community Engagement in Local Elections. My interest in politics in general really started in eighth grade when I began following election results and election maps on social media, and I began creating my own election maps, like the one seen here. Because of this passion for politics, as my senior year was approaching, in February of 2023, I reached out to UVA's Center for Politics, and I was able to obtain a professional learning experience with Miles Coleman, an editor for the Center for Politics Crystal Ball publication, who I had previously known through his posting of maps on social media. I quickly learned that his job wasn't just about political analysis, it also involved responding to press inquiries such as 10 questions from a reporter that I answered about George Santos. In addition to that war of responding to press inquiries, honestly, the most personally satisfying part of my internship was being able to write a draft article for the crystal ball pre previewing Virginia's state legislative elections, and it was extremely satisfying to see it incorporated into a published article with some revisions. Every election is decided by the people who show up. This quote by Larry Sabato, the namesake of the crystal ball, is especially 
prescient for Orange County because in 2019, the UI started following politics. The Commonwealth's attorney election was decided by just 27 votes. This history of close elections in Orange County led me to consider and realize that when elections are decided by such a close margin, it is necessary to ensure that everyone who is eligible to vote votes. And because youth historically have among the lowest rates of voter participation in all levels of elections, my question focused on youth, what are the most effective ways of increasing informed voter engagement and participation among youth in local elections. I've initially found two main methods and factors. One, changing election laws to make it easier to vote, and two, direct voter outreach to youth. And I primarily focus on the second method in my service, such as here in this voter registration drive at the Orange County Street Fair, but I quickly realized that I could also pre-register students to vote because many students who are 16 or 17 but won't be 18 by election day are not eligible to register to vote, but they can pre-register to vote, expanding my possible impact. Based on a study that I found showing that in some circumstances, peer-to-peer -peer presentations can increase likelihood of voting, I gave presentations to senior government classes with information about registering to vote, voting locations, and offices on the ballot. And in an action research survey I gave, 28 of the 71 respondents said that they planned on registering to vote or pre-registering to vote if they hadn't already. This event occurred over three weeks before the election, and so I realized that I needed to do something to and saw that students remembered the election was happening. So I talked with my mentor, Ms. Damerson, for my community service, and she helped me come up with the idea of hosting a mock election during lunch on Monday, November 6th. This event, the day before the election, served to help increase awareness of the election among students. Based on my research, I decided to also pass out I voted stickers to participants in the mock election with the goal of sparking conversations between participants and their friends or even older family members about the importance of voting. As part of my research for my export interview, I interviewed Kara Ong Whaley an employee of the Center for Politics who focused on outreach to youth, especially college students at UVA, and one of the tactics she used was passing out shorts to students, such as the one seen here, aimed at increasing awareness of voting. This also brings me to my third method for increasing youth engagement or local elections media, which I found out by talking with Ms. Whaley, who said that media is one of the biggest factors impacting the information available to youth. After the election was over and I had done my community service, I still had unanswered questions about what I could do to fix the issue of lack of media resources. And so I had an interview with Anjali Shah, the editor of Shah's Road Tomorrow, an online publication, and she suggested that I could start a student newspaper with peer-created media to help solve this issue. I have laid the groundwork for the creation of a student newspaper in the future by creating a student newsletter with information about events in the school community, and I have established a group of younger students to help maintain the newsletter so that will continue publication after I am gone. 
I would just like to take a moment to say to future BRVGS seniors, this really shows why it is important to continue with your project even once you have the required hours if you have an unanswered question. I had completed the required number of hours for my project before I got to this phase, but I still didn't know how I could impact the media component. And so I kept going and I feel like I will be able to have a bigger impact as a result. In terms of my future plans, I am planning on studying political science, public policy, or a related field in college. And I am strongly considering Georgetown University or the University of Richmond, though I'm still waiting on other colleges to decide. I would like to take a moment to thank my mentor, Miles Corman, and my community service advisor, Ms. Jamerson, who has helped me greatly both with this project and with my efforts to explore local politics through student government. Are there any questions? Yeah. Question. Um, yes. We we're looking at the uh, statistics for youth voter rate in, here in Orange County. How does Orange County stack up to the rest of Virginia in terms of our young people voting? So I wasn't actually able to find a specific way. Like I asked, mm -hmm. I asked the registrar actually because she was at an event that I did at the high school, but she didn't have statistics by by age, at least not for voting rate. Right. I, I was just curious to see how Orange County stacks up, but I understand sometimes you can't always yeah. find that stuff. And the article that you, you helped co-write, is, yes. is that available online? I'd like to uh, definitely take a look at that. At yes, point. it is. That's awesome. So that was not specifically, that was partly what I found in the section about, in my research about election laws making voting more restrictive or less restrictive, like laws that make it really hard for card students to request an absentee ballot or just make it confusing would qualify as laws which would make it more difficult to vote. And so then one way to expand youth participation would be to work toward removing those laws or replacing them. Going over now, or sorry, Katie Reynolds is going to present about Lyme disease in rural communities. 
Okay, hi everybody. As you know, I'm Sadie Reynolds. Um, my presentation is Lyme's disease in rural communities, preventing by educating. Um, my question was basically, how are rural communities impacted by Lyme's disease and how can we lessen that impact? Uh, one of the reasons I chose this question actually is because when I was four, I was diagnosed with Lyme's disease um, and then I had a really bad, well, I guess either reinfection or flare up, whatever you want to call it, in eighth grade. And ever since then, I have tested positive continuously for Lyme's disease. Um, and it's made a pretty big impact on my life, and I would really, uh, I would really, really like to prevent anybody else from suffering and struggling with that the way I have, because I think uh, it's very prevalent in this community. Um, so here's what I found. I had a, like, a three-part question, which is the epidemiology of Lyme disease, so where it is, what are the environmental implications, um, what are the treatment and preventation methods, such as you know, antibiotics, vaccines, um, bug spray, and then what are the healthcare uh, components in rural communities in comparison to urban areas? So what I found is that Lyme disease is much more prevalent in rural areas simply because of deer being the main carrier of the ticks, and deer like to live in the woods. That's you know a given. Um, and then what I found is that the treatment is actually pretty limited. Um, antibacterials don't always work for Lyme's disease. Like they didn't work for me. I've taken multiple courses and they just, for whatever reason, don't work. It's not antibiotic resistance. People don't really understand it. Uh, vaccines are limited. There used to be a vaccines for humans back in the 70s. However, the single company that produced it shut down due to it not being profitable. Um, so this came to be the only way I could lessen the impact being preventing people from getting infected in the first place. Um, and so, I looked at the health in rural communities, healthcare, and it turns out there are a very, very big difference in the concentration of medical resources for people in rural communities and urban areas. Um, you know, there are not many clinics around here, and I found that there is a general stigma for many rural people, including farmers, to not want to go to the doctor. Um, and that means that the people who are spending time outside in these rural areas also aren't spending time at the doctors. So this meant I couldn't do any sort of in-clinic campaign for awareness or presentation methods. Um, so I interned at UVA Health to figure out how it was impacting the people in the clinic and what the symptoms were and how people communicated about Lyme's disease efficiently. Um, I interned with Mary Yao and Dr. Diane Pappas. With Mary Yao, I studied her, she's an educational liaison, and I studied how she communicated from the educational standpoint, like schools, to the medical standpoint. She works explaining to people um, what's going on with the student medically and what sort of accommodations they need. And then with Dr. Diane Pappas, I would follow her into her patients, into the, you know, her office, and observe how she would talk to the patients and take care of issues and concerns and communicate efficiently um, the you know symptoms and problems that she saw fit. Um, and then for my community service, I decided to make a poster uh, because I knew that I couldn't work in clinics as much because people weren't at clinics because there were limited clinics in rural areas. I decided I was going to need to put these up in areas outdoors because the places where people are getting ticks are outside and I want them, the people who are at risk to have resources as they are exposed or you know hopefully not so that way it's not feeling irrelevant to them you know as you're going you're hiking you're seeing these signs saying don't get sick avoid the tick um on these i put you know presentation methods like checking your bodies for ticks wearing clothing that covers your arms and legs bug spray and avoiding tall and grassy wooded areas as well as symptoms of lyme's disease to encourage people to go to the doctors if they are feeling sick um, I feel, though, that that wasn't quite enough for my project because there are just so many complications about Lyme's disease and how it impacts the community and just who has it. So I included a QR code which links back to my web page, which provides resources for people such as infectious disease specialists in the area, clinics, and maps about Lyme's disease as well as the CDC's definition of Lyme's disease. Um, I used a QR code because if you are outside, there is a chance that you do not have good LTE and coverage. So people who are outside are able to take a photo and then later when they have Wi-Fi or internet, they are able to actually go to the link later so that you know they can access this at a later time if they don't have LTE. 
Um, on my webpage, I also had a form evaluating my poster and asking people what they knew prior to the poster and how they felt it communicated and what they felt about the graphics. Um, for this poster, I worked with Mr. Tim Mowbray and Joseph Fallon uh, with Orange County Parks and Rec. Um, Joseph Fallon does a lot of the digital design and graphics for Orange County, and Tim Mowbray is the head of Orange County Parks and Rec. Um, with them, I worked on how I could create my poster in the format and correct, like the correct, um, oh goodness, I'm blinking. The correct specifications for Orange County, such as using the correct um, fonts, the correct colors, the correct uh, seal, you know, as you can see, I have to have all of the, those are specific colors because Orange County actually only can use specific hex codes, um, which was something I didn't know. Um, I, you know, as we communicated, we had several different drafts. This was my earliest one, as you can see. I had to figure out how I wanted to format the text, you know, how wide it should be, how small it should be, what I should say, because, you know, I had a limited amount of space and I needed to make sure my words were concise and stuff. And I worked with both um, my professional shadowing and my community service to make sure I was including all the information I needed to effectively communicate about Lyme's disease. Um, what was really awesome is when I was pitching this idea to the, to the Orange County Parks and Recs, they were really excited about it and they actually offered to metal print my signs. Originally I was going to simply laminate them, but they told me that that wouldn't last very long and it was something they were really interested in doing. Um, already and so that I had provided them a great opportunity to actually go ahead and metal print it and put it up in parks all around Orange, um, which was just incredible. So I was, I was so shocked. It was really, really awesome. Um, so they are now up actually in Booster Park. Um, they're going up in the Disc Golf. There's two Disc Golfs in Orange County and then the Barbersville Playground and the Unionville Playground, I believe. Um, so, you know, they're going to last and people are going to be able to get the information they need about Lyme's disease um, and hopefully just prevent anybody from getting sick. Uh, my impact, here they are. You can see they're up. They're metal signs. They're printed. Um, if you'd like to take a photo, you can actually go to the website now and fill out the form and look at all the resources and information I have on that. Um, and, you know, obviously them being metal printed, they're going to last. <laughs> they're going to last pretty long. Um, so hopefully people, you know, you're going to a game, you're going to go watch your kid play baseball and you just see these little signs and you kind of subconsciously read things and you'll, you'll just absorb that information and, you know, next time you go and you're like, oh, wait a sec, I have Lyme's disease, I should probably take a tick off of me if there's one. Um, so also here are some very low quality images, unfortunately, of my beautiful poster of the form that people filled out saying, how they felt if you experienced any of the above symptoms, would you go to the doctor? Yes, being 20, 75%, and then maybe being uh, the small 25%, and then 100% said that, I, that they felt the posters communicated the preventative measures and symptoms efficiently. So I was really happy to hear that. Um, you know, as those responses come back, you know, I might make edits to my poster because I actually, hopefully, over the summer, I would like to get in touch with several of the Civil War trips. Civil War trails in Orange County and see if I can put them up on the trails as well um, and other outdoor areas. Um, so, you know, I can make some edits to that and still improve it, although I can't improve the ones that have already been printed, obviously, and unfortunately. My experience was really, really interesting because I didn't really know that Orange County itself had a specific requirement for how the graphics work for, you know, the seal has to have a certain amount of clearance from other parts of the poster, you know, you have to have specific hex codes, specific fonts. And I, I thought that was really, really interesting because it just, I feel like it slips everybody's mind. Um, and then it was just incredible seeing Dr. Diane Pappas working with her patients and how she was able to just easily and seamlessly connect from one topic to another and help people, like, inform people about their health and important issues that they may have without offending or making people feel confused or blamed. Um, that was really incredible. I also really, it was really great. Um, my advisors, uh, Rachel Carlton and Elizabeth Herndon, they gave me so much help and flexibility with my project because um, I had several lumps and bumps, including people not really wanting to email me back. And they just kind of kept encouraging me to keep reaching out and keep finding new ways to, you know, work on my project and it was it was incredible you know 
without them, I don't know if I could have gotten the project done. It's, it was something I wanted to do even outside of Burbank's, um, but they, I don't know if I could have done it outside of Burbank's. I may not have had the motivation, you know, and it was just, it was really, really, really incredible to be able to hopefully impact people in a way and that I have been impacted myself, you know, these posters, <laughs> I really, I really hope that they, um, they keep people from getting sick and, you know, it, it's just, I'm so, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for my experience. Um, I plan to go to Virginia Tech for my future. Um, I want to major in industrial design. So while that isn't really healthcare and Lyme's disease, it is a lot of art and graphics, which is where my community service will have a lot of experience for me, you know, learning about the requirements and parameters. Um, oh, that's my future, whoops. Uh, yeah, so I'm really excited to go and do industrial design with Virginia Tech. I wanted to have a thank you to Dr. Diane Pappas, Mary Yao, Joseph Fallon, Tim Mowbray, Rachel Carlton, and Elizabeth Herndon. Yes? I did think about that. I did reach out to um, the head of the FFA, and she directed me to Tim Mowbray as well. Um, I'd like to see still if I could do something with him. However, I thought that like a one-time presentation or like, you know, outreach thing would be kind of less impact than actually putting up something permanent. So I, if I were to go with the FFA and work with them later, um, I'd have to think of some sort of permanent thing I could put up like with their programs because. I'd like it to last. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oh, wait, sorry, yes. That's fine. Um, I noticed that so you got 16 respondents on the survey. Are yes. Are you able to, uh, how many people clicked that QR code? Just how far this got out? Were you able to collect that data? Um, I was not a lot able to collect how many people actually clicked the QR code, um, unfortunately. Um, but I can, you know, I can see how many people responded to the actual thing. Uh, I wish I could see that because it can give you the data of when and who and where it was clicked from. But uh, unfortunately, I was unable to do that. Thank you. Oh, wait, Mike. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and take a break before we get right into this class changes. So, first of all, can you go back to your, your dive screen and then other classes will come in? So, comment.
All right, continuing on into our next group, Beth Golden with interest in engineering in younger people and women. So my name is Cyrus and I decided to do my senior project on uh, engineering and I, uh, my research, pro research question was interest in engineering in women and younger people. So I've always had an interest in engineering since I was young, just from like building things and creating things. And this interest really elevated in high school when I took engineering classes. And this really introduced me to the way engineering worked and all that. And I was mainly interested in mechanical engineering for the longest time because that is what I was mainly uh, exposed to. I wasn't exposed to any like of the civil engineering or architectural engineering parts. But later on, I, as I got exposed to these, I learned to enjoy these more as well. So this is just some pictures of some of the stuff that I did. And engineering is uh, cool just because there's so many aspects it covers and it's needed a lot by the like the community and society and all that. Um, so for my community service, I went to the uh, Boys and Girls Club at Orange, and I um, held like STEM sessions with uh, another beer video student, Allison Metter, and um, uh, I did engineering projects such as building towers uh, with paper to see who can build the tallest tower, and also explaining how um, like in, uh, like structures can be stronger with certain materials and certain designs. So my mentor was James Miller, and um, he was really helpful with allowing us to use the Boys and Girls Club as a space to uh, help uh, teach the younger generations about uh, how engineering works and about STEM. And he also helped us by giving us possible ideas and materials that we may, might have needed to do our projects. For my um, internship, I went, I uh, interned at a place called Site Tech. They do um, sort of architectural and uh, site, site planning. So they get um, designs from architects about, about um, like, plans for buildings or uh, like roads and they would see the specifications and they could plan out the how much material was needed to be removed if the site would work they could make adjustments and they could relay this information this information is important for the companies and contractors because removing material from a site is expensive and bringing in new materials is also expensive, so they could help them plan it out so they could remove as, as little as material as possible, and they could reuse material in other parts of the, in the site so that less has to be ex exported out and less has to be imported in. My mentor for my uh, internship was Randy Ham, and he was helpful because he uh, allowed me to work at he allowed me to do stuff at Site Tech, and he helped me. He learned. He taught me how to uh, use the program that they used, and taught me a lot of the ways that they used the program. And he also allowed me to uh, do some practice on previous uh, site things they had, so I could learn how to use the program more efficiently, and uh, also just learn how architects make architectural designs for. Uh, sites and for real life buildings. So these are some pictures from my community service and internship. Uh, th in this picture, I was showing how to build structures with marshmallows and pops and uh, spaghetti sticks. Uh, this was helpful as it showed how structures have to be supported for them to stand up, and they can't be. They have to have planning to them, and that is one of the. The picture on the right is one of the uh, site plannings I did, uh, where this was a site for this was a site for um, a hotel, I think, or a parking lot, and they 
and I did the design, not the design, the site planning, and uh, it was very informational because I learned a lot. For my research question, I focused on interest in engineering and women uh, and younger people because the engineering field is about 15% women and it's a very low number. And there are many also uh, new engineering jobs being created every day. And there are not uh, enough people uh, graduating from college and going into the engineering field with engineering degrees to keep up with the demand. So and informing younger people about engineering and getting them excited and informed will help, should help um, get more people into the engineering field. Um, another thing is with, I learned in my research is that uh, a lot of people, a lot of people have perceived, uh, can, ha have perceptions of engineers and in some studies, they found that when that like, kids were asked to draw an engineer, they'd usually draw a man who had like business clothes on, and it showed how people think of engineers as mostly men and who mostly work in office settings. While in reality, engineers can also work on site, so they can uh, plan out and uh, find the specifications of the site, so they can more effectively plan out their designs. So what I learned is that I have a very, still very strong interest in engineering. And I learned that I'm also more interested in architectural and architectural and civil engineering rather than mechanical engineering, because uh, I just find it more interesting. And it ha I feel like it has a lot more uh, real life applications because a lot of buildings have to be built every year and uh, mechanic and I just find it more interesting in general. Some advice I might have for um, future senior uh, seniors in BRVGS is to start your planning early and uh, make sure that during the summer you at least have some framework for where you might want to do your senior internship and your community service as people might not always write you back and it takes time for all this planning to come out. So if you wait until the last minute, it'll be tough and you'll have a lot of stress to deal with. Some acknowledgements I like to do, I like to have uh, James Miller, the uh, community service intern, community service mentor. He really helped with uh, project and give me ideas for what to do during the community service. Randy Ham, because he allowed me to work at their company just on some uh, like previous designs they had to do and helped me learn. And he is also allowing me to continue working there. And I am planning to work there soon, sometime in March again. Uh, for Allison Metter, the uh, person I worked with in the community service, uh, she really helped uh, with that, giving ideas and uh, just getting the whole thing set up as well. Another one person I'd like to thank is Ms. Jamerson for teaching engineering classes and really making me like uh, more inter interested in engineering and allowing me to explore engineering more. Are there any questions? Uh, yep. So uh, an engineering field that is very high in demand is architectural and civil engineering because there's still so many parts of the world that have to be developed and uh, buildings are always being created. So they need more people to help with these designs. And a lot of the engineers are close to retirement age. So they need people to fill in the gaps that they will leave when they retire.
Emanuri, and fostering future language learners. Good morning, everybody. Um, so across the United States, only 39% of public middle schools offer in-person language education. And by the time those students get to secondary education, only 7% of them will still be taking language courses. So to increase and improve the statistic, I decided to focus my project on linguistics. So my passion for language started at a really young age. Um, this is my aunt who, through her uh, language ability, especially in Latin culture and Spanish, um, was able to improve a lot of people's lives. And she just, I saw her go through that and it made me love language and want to help people through that too. Um, and so to start off my project, I did my internship, my professional learning experience at the University of Virginia, um, a local college here in Virginia. And I spent a total of 26 hours with two professors. Um, this is my first professor that I shadowed, Janae Crabtree, and the second one is Dr. Lise Dobrin. Um, here, uh, Dr. Crabtree's uh, classroom, and this is Dr. Lise Dobrin's classroom. Um, Dr. Janae Crabtree focused more on language and how to teach language, um, and Dr. Janae Crab or um, Dr. Lise Dobrin focused on um, how society and language interact. Um, in both of these classes, I took notes on both the material taught and more specifically how they taught that material to their students, um, especially in this class here. Um, I would talk with her after school about how to translate the stuff that we were learning in class, like um, data problem sets with language, um, and how to translate those lessons into a younger age group, um, which is where I would be focusing my community service. Um, I was very successful at my time here. Um, they offered me a spot to help and teach at a event called Lingleets, which is mathletes, but for language. Um, and I participated in that and helped that, um, help and encourage people um, to be interested in language through that as well. Um, here to further my understanding of how to teach language, I interviewed the director of linguistics at UVA, Dr. Mark Sokoli. Um, and during this two hour interview, we talked about things like what are the best methods to teach language, um, is group uh, work really that beneficial, and um, why are the benefits of teaching language so important? So things like cognitive benefits and why it's more important to target a younger age group. Um, to further my research, my research paper, uh, the topic I chose was what are the best three methods of language acquisition for younger age groups? Um, and in those methods, I found that creating a comfortable environment to learn so that students don't feel pressure to make mistakes. Um, and then implementing media, so learning language in a fluid and natural context like movies, music, um, and literature. And then also doing cultural immersion, so really experiencing language, not just memorizing facts and learning it. To implement all of the things that I learned, I did my community service at Prospect Heights Middle School. Um, and at Prospect Heights Middle School, I spent a total of 16 hours with Ms. McGinnis, the culture teacher um, at Prospect. And the reason I chose Prospect is that it's a local middle school. And it is one of those middle schools where we do not have an in-person teacher for any sort of language. Um, it's all online, and students really struggle with that. Um, so my goals going into my community service were to help inspire the kids to try and take more language courses, and also help prepare them for their first in-person course where it's going to be more rigorous than online. So in all of my time um, at the middle school, I taught in lectures and um, activities, but I also created a culture day um, at the end. In lessons that I taught to the kids, I focused on both culture immersion and language acquisition ability. Um, this is me teaching a grammatical lesson. Um, and so I would give students background and the necessary information to go into the lesson. And then I would allow the students to go back and do what I learned from Dr. Mark Sokoli as um,
productive struggle, which means the students learn better figuring out what they need to learn for themselves, not me teaching what the students need to know. Um, and so once they got done with that, they were able to work in group work, um, which is another thing I found to be very beneficial. The students were able to bounce things off of each other and not feel as much pressure to like mess up creating a comfortable environment that I talked about earlier. Um, so this is one of the lessons that we taught in culture. Um, this is a candy sugar skull um, that the kids made as part of Latin culture. And this is one of the worksheets that students did. Um, this is a lesson that I did at UVA called the language data set. And the kids were very, like, they were super excited to, like, feel like they were doing something that a college student was doing. Um, and even though it was dumbed down to, like, so they could, you know, do it and complete it in a professional manner. Um, this is the culture day that I hosted at the end. So the culture day um, was meant to inspire students that were not just in the culture class that I was already teaching to be involved with language. And um, so kids from all around the school were able to come in and we had, I was more than happy with the um, students that showed up. There were about 54 students that weren't previously in the class. They were able to come in and experience language through not only food, but music, movies, um, crafts, different thing, games. They had a lot of fun. Um, I was able to not only teach them about Latin culture, but also my own culture. And the students were very excited about that. I was able to bring in um, kimonos, let the kids see actual Japanese fans. Um, and I taught them about traditions such as the um, origami cranes. Um, the kids were actually more um, open to trying new foods than I thought they would be, which I was very excited about. Um, they definitely opened up more going on, but even some of the more crazier things that I brought in, like shrimp flavored trips, um, they actually, they were gone by the end of the day. So that was, I was really excited about that. Um, so to measure my impact on that I had on all of the students, I sent out a survey um, at the end of my class. Um, so one of the questions I asked in the survey was, what is the likelihood of you taking a language class again in the future? Um, and they were able to answer one through 10, one being not at all, and 10 being, I am guaranteed to take another language class in the future um, after my experience there. 92.9% um, of students answered a six and higher, meaning that they are very likely to take another language class in the future. And five students or 35.7% of students answered a 10, which means they are guaranteed to take another language class in the future after my experience with them. Um, so things moving on um, or advice that I have for future BRBGS students doing this is probably don't feel pressure to start in the summer, but feel pressure to start emailing soon because people um, a lot of times don't get back to you. Um, and that was a problem that I had, um, especially for interviews. I emailed a bunch of different um, sources and they either didn't email or canceled. Um, and so it's okay, I found a new avenue to pursue, but definitely getting out information and reaching out as soon as possible so you do have time to make second paths and uh, retry is the most important thing. Um, learning in terms of what I learned um, about myself, I came into this project already loving languages and knowing that I love languages and linguistics but I kind of learned that I love teaching it too. I love seeing that kids got just as excited as I was to learn about languages as, or they are to learn about languages as I was. And it was really helpful seeing kids like want to pursue something that I want to pursue, like, and knowing that I helped them do that. Um, and in terms of my future plans, I'm going to be going to a four year university, hopefully the University of Virginia. Um, where I interned, and I'm going to study linguistics at wherever I'm at. Um, I would like to give a thank you to Dr. Mark Zakolai and uh, Mrs. Renee Burke, both my first points of contact for my community service and my internship. Um, they allowed me to come into their schools, their classrooms, teach and learn, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. I'd also like to give a shout out to Ms. Carlton and Ms. Herndon. They really helped. Um, inspire me and motivate me to actually get stuff done. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Any questions?
going to college to study linguistics, but what are the chances that you're going to go and look forward? We obviously have this big gap where we need. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> I probably will not teach as a profession, um, but I definitely it is something that I would pursue in college. Um, and I've kind of set up a system even here um, because I was so successful at the my community service and at the middle school. Um, Mrs. Renee Burke, the principal there, um, was very interested in content making this continue on and letting someone else come back and replace me and continue helping out there. And so, even though. I probably won't be teaching. Um, someone else can, and that's what's important. So. Um, he took the student to the middle school. Do you see that this could be adapted down to the elementary level as well, and get those kids in, involved at the elementary level? Is there a, a need or a space for that? Um, the need is not as great because we have a lot of, especially ELL teachers there, stuff to um, a lot of more in-person work with aides and stuff like that. So it's not as big of a need. But it definitely can be taken to the elementary school because um, what I learned in, at UVA, it can be adapted. Language acquisition can be adapted to any age, um, no matter where you are. Um, I didn't speak to anyone, but through my experience, um, even when I went through the middle school almost, four, well, four years ago now, um, we didn't have an in-person teacher, and it's really just resource um, needed. Like, we can't find anyone, um, and when we do, they won't stay. So, yeah, it's just really based on resources, but I know they would love to have someone. It just doesn't work out sometimes. Um, this was all done between the months of September and November. So I got done with my culture day, which was the last thing I did um, around mid-November. Um, but I started going to my internship all the way back in like the August 31st, like last day of August, and then um, continued on. So I went for quite a while.
Stand up here again. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna plug you in. Okay, is that okay? Stick this. What are you doing on your tie? I don't care. Okay. I think this is good. Okay, there you go. And then just remember, down is next. Like when you're editing a slide. I prefer to hold it that direction, actually. Okay. Well, then that would be next. <laughs> that makes sense. And then, then this is the the little pointer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to point anything, you can, and then go back again. Okay. Cool. This, this one is back. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Okay. You want to see a one year, one hour workout? Oh, that's so cute. Oh, oh my goodness. My son named him Ricky Bobby. That was like an hour old. An hour old. That was too old. Coming back through Ty Callahan and the fight for equality in public education. Good morning. My name is Kai, and I did my project on the fight for equality in public education, um, small changes to rural Virginia for the furthering of human rights. So my topic was about um, the public education and making it more accepting for all students. 
especially LGBTQ plus students, but also any minority, anything like that. Um, so I wanted to do this because I am a part of the community and um, I feel that it's important for everybody to feel safe and comfortable coming to any school, including ours. <laughs> So my, my research question was, what are the best ways to support LGBTQ plus youth in a rural, a rural, a rural, a rural community? <laughs> and um, I found that um, a lot of it was um, teacher education and training situations, um, inclusive curriculum, and um, allowing like a space for people to gather which um, we actually don't have a lot of in Orange County. Um, there's like, when I was looking through, I found that there was basically nothing in Orange County for queer students to meet with each other. And I was like, hey, that's kind of weird. We should make that a thing for everybody to be able to do. <laughs> so um, for my professional learning experience, I um, interned here Orange County High School shadowing teachers and um, um, Mr. Price, the principal. Um, so the first teacher I worked with is um, Mr. John Benfer, my um, advisor as well. Um, we worked together. He gave me it, it, advisement um, for like what I should do and how I should do it. And also I worked with his class a little bit um, to, and I was allowed to talk to them about my project and a lot of them were interested in it, which I thought was really cool. Um, I also worked with Mr. Artuzio, who's a math teacher here at OCHS. Um, I remember him as sort of like a fun, goofy guy. He'll talk to you and he'll be like, yeah, you kind of did that wrong, but like, here's how you can fix it. Um, and I also worked with Mr. Winesett, who is our physics and chemistry teacher. He did pose like that willingly. Um, <laughs> he's a very goofy guy. Um, he talks to us in a fun way while also in introducing education, which is um, really fun. So what I, oh, that's Mr. Price. <laughs> he is our administrator, our principal here at OCHS. And I wanted to work with him to see um, how all of this comes together from the administration side, um, how all of this kind of connects and what his job is as the principal keeping track of everything. So I did this for about um, 14 hours um, over the span of November and December, working um, one block each with all of these teachers, shadowing them, looking into what they do, how they connect with students um, to see what sort of like comfortability can be made by like personal connection and understanding of each other. And I found I felt that this was significant to the school ecosystem as a whole, because what I was doing is I was looking into how teachers can be better, um, which our teachers are already great. Um, but there's that extra step of the student feeling like that's like the best environment they can be in. And for my community service, I ran a group at Witch's Brew Cafe, um, which is um, a coffee shop local to Loc or Locust Grove. Um, and my goal was to um, bridge the generational divide of LGBTQ plus individuals and um, allow people of all age groups to meet with each other and ex understand each other's experiences. Um, so this is me, this is my first meeting. Um, I was talking a lot about like what, what they felt in their lives and also introducing my own personal experiences of what I felt in my own personal circumstances. And it's that conversation that gets things started makes a community. Um, I had actually found during my research portion that, um, that there was absolutely nothing when I looked on Google and I was like, okay, what can I do if I wanna go to like a um, local LGBTQ plus group in Orange County? 
absolutely nothing. The only thing I found on the internet was a story about um, Wisteria Ivy, who um, was denied funding from the um, art center. And like they took away the funding from the art center because she was trying to hold a drag, like a drag demonstration there, um, which I thought was really sad. And I was like, why don't we fix this? So this is Miss Alicia Vines. Um, I worked with her briefly um, when I was trying to set up um, when I was trying to set up um, like advertisement for my group. Um, I reached out to the youth council and I was like, "Hey, would you guys be willing to like support this?" Because I didn't feel safe going through the school because of certain situations happening here, and I was like. I kind of want to just be my own entity so I don't have to interact with all the crazy that happens at Orange County High School. So I reached out to Miss Alicia Vines and I was like, hey, would you mind supporting this so that I can do this without just being some random guy? <laughs> and this is Witches Brew Cafe. Like I said, it's a local organization friendly to anybody who comes in the doors. Um, I worked there for about 16 hours on my community service, holding meetings, making um, promotional material, things such as that. Um, and this is, again, the first group. And I'm going to talk, um, my significance is the lives that I've touched through doing this group. Um, while there aren't, on, there aren't that many, just that small impact can help with everything in their lives, in my life, and enrich the community even more. And from this, I learned that I'm capable of standing up in front of people and talking to people because I had thought, there's no way I'm doing that. I'm socially anxious. I just can't stand up and talk to people. But here I am standing up and talking to people. <laughs> and I felt that, um, working in my community service helped me a lot with understanding that connection and how to talk to a large amount of people. <laughs> so um, my advice to people who are joining the BRVGS program and doing their senior project is, especially if you are like in an extracurricular activity, start early because your your first semester of senior year is it's rough i'm not going to lie and you just you need to start it early so that you can focus on what you need to focus on during the first semester and then the second semester feels so much better um and my future plans i'm going to go to virginia tech for chemical engineering and it's a funny story because i actually started this presentation like started working on my senior project thinking I was going to be an English teacher. So th there's a big change there. All right, are there any questions? Yes. How did you, how did you advertise uh, the event? So I had, oh, sorry. Really sorry. Exactly so I made a, um, a little flyer where I was like, here's what we are, here's what we do. Feel free to come. Um, please fill out this Google form because there is a rather small uh, maximum occupancy in the Witches Brew Cafe. So I was like, please fill out this form and I'll let you guys know. And look, there was no issue with the um, occupancy, but it's it was more of like a I kind of want to know who's coming, but like if you don't really feel comfortable, just fill out a form anyway, just don't include like your name or your email or anything like that. Put it up on, on social media or was it like flyers around the community? Yeah, so it came out from the um, the youth council social media. That's okay. the, yeah. Any any plans uh, to continue these events or to have more of these events within the community? Is that part of the, the legacy? Yeah, um, so I'm currently working on it. Um, my goal is to find a space where um, the people can continue to meet because even though I will be gone at college, um, a lot of people in the group are still interested in meeting and growing. So my current thought is to work with the library 
like the public library, see if we can rent a space or something like that? Yes. Um, so for Blue Ridge Virtual Governor School, I feel like you guys already do really well with like coming to the school and talking to people. I was actually having a discussion with my community service last night. I was like, hey guys, um, what can we do like in the public school, in your opinion, to make things better? And they were like, more mental health support. And I was like, okay, I don't know what to do with that, but I'll keep it in mind. Um, but I feel like um, Virtual Governor School can do a lot better with, um, so I have to collect my thoughts really quick. Just being there and providing resources and understanding that some situations are a little more sensitive. I did like, um, when I was in ninth grade, and I was like, I want to start changing my emails to the actual name I want to go by. You all were very accommodating. Orange County High School was not very accommodating. <laughs> so I did like that. Jackson? So based on your professional experience with these what suggestions would you have for how resource email support is exactly at Orange County? So I feel that a lot of it, a lot, um, many of our teachers are supportive, but a lot of students feel that they aren't. So I feel that a lot more of that personal connection can be made with um, students and teachers to improve the communication path between the two groups. Sadie? I was very worried that something was going to happen and people were going to start like rioting and I'm like, oh, please don't. <laughs> but like at the same time, if it happens, I'll deal with it because it's my community. And just because we are queer does not mean that we don't have the same opportunities as say, I want to hold a youth group for my church. Hi guys, I'm Natalie, and this is my project, Better Together, to show you guys the importance behind inclusion. So deciding that I wanted to base my senior project on special education came really easy to me because, as some of you may know, my younger brother Cooper is special needs. Um, he was born with um, visual problems and also many learning disabilities. Um, we're really close, so ever since I was young, I've kind of told myself that I want to do anything I can to help him, but also other kids like him with special needs. So as I started off my internship, I went to Locust Grove Elementary School in October for about four hours. Um, I went here during a teacher developmental day so I could spend more direct time with a teacher when no students are around to kind of see what happens like behind the scenes. I interned with Ms. Holly Hannaford. She is the head of special education teacher at this elementary school. When I explained that I was interested in learning about like the paperwork side of things and like learning what like because I have experience with special education students and I wanted to know what happens when they're not there. Um, I got to spend a lot of time in her classroom with her learning about 
uh, individual education plans and how grading differs for every student. I thought it was very interesting that there's a different plan to accommodate to each student so because everyone has different disabilities so it wouldn't be fair to grade everyone the same. Um, not only did I meet with her but I also um, sat in on a meeting that she had with a standard education teacher that has an inclusive classroom. So listening to how she includes students with special needs with her students that don't have any disabilities was really interesting to me and like hearing that how that student does surrounding themselves with other students was really interesting. The second half of my internship was held at Locust Grove Middle School. This was in December um, during a full day of school. Students were there. This was not my original plan, but due to some circumstances that were kind of out of my control, I kind of had to switch my path a little bit. But luckily, um, Miss Kendra Adams was very welcoming to me and my kind of like last minute switch that I had to do for my internship. Um, she's also the current teacher of my little brother, so it was kind of cool to see just kind of how she works with him from like an outside point of view. Um, during their class, um, I kind of just saw the different schedules that they had laid out for each student and kind of what made it easier for them and kind of like they made learning fun. Like seeing my little brother spell words and read was something that I normally don't get to see because he doesn't do that <laughs> at home or anything. So seeing her have this bond with students to make learning fun and interesting was awesome. And not only did they do stuff like reading and math, they watched the news, they talked about the weather, they even made pizzas at the end of class. So it was very interesting to see them kind of teach them about not just standard education stuff, but life skills that they'll need in the future. Um, so moving forward into my research, the question that I had were, what are the most effective ways for public schools to create inclusive learning environments for those adaptive learners? The methods that I found to be the most helpful for this were creating inclusion during academics, athletics, but also social acceptance. And this doesn't mean just accepting them in their own classroom, but throughout the entire school with their peers, their administration, and other teachers that are not the ones that they see every day in their classroom. Um, for my community service, I kind of focus more on the athletic point of things and um, like also social acceptance. So I worked with the Hornet Heroes Athletics Program. Um, this is a program here at our high school that allows students with special needs to take part in sports and activities that they normally don't have like available to them. Um, my mentor throughout this entire project was Miss Chambers. Um, she is the head of adaptive education in Orange County. Um, we have a very close relationship and she has shown me the importance behind giving those with special needs the same opportunities as everybody else. Um, throughout this time, I spent 20 hours in the fall going on several bowling trips with the students and I continued on with my intern, I mean my community service in the winter with the basketball league and I will still be um, doing it in the spring during their kickball season. Um, as I worked with them, I kind of got to see a new side of like things. Um, not only was I there like helping obviously and like teaching them how to shoot or bowl or anything, I made like bonds with them that are truly indescribable. Like I sat and had a whole conversation with one boy about Taylor Swift and it's just getting to know them is like so much deeper than what people assume and kind of people assume that I'm just going there to help and just like tell them what to do but really engaging and getting to know them and what they like to do and their fan like they tell me about their families and what their favorite sport is was really touching to me because I feel like they don't always get to be seen as deep as I got to know them. Um, for my legacy on my community service, I focused on bettering this program and kind of making it more supported throughout the school system. I met with our principal a few times just to talk about it and how strongly I felt for this program. Um, as some of you may know, last year, we kind of weren't allowed to have anybody come watch them. Like it was like the gym classes because they had nowhere to go. But 
um, other classes weren't really allowed to go. And I felt like that was unfair because our varsity football team, our varsity basketball teams get to have people come every day to come watch them and support them and create student sections for them. And this team just wasn't allowed to have a crowd. So I asked him about it. He was completely open to it and really kind of made it honestly like towards the teachers, like if they wanted to have their class come. And I know uh, clearly a lot of teachers were interested and a lot of teachers wanted to come support and watching the students like light up in their faces when the crowd like would cheer after they made a basket or literally start chants for certain players. It was awesome to see. And even on their senior night, they had banners. They had the lights turned off and a spotlight for them to run out under. And it was just like a really awesome experience to be a part of. And it makes like, uh, like them, the play, like their energy throughout the whole like program completely changed when they had support from the people around them. They saw students that they have never had conversations before, cheering them on in the stands, everyone standing up and going crazy when they win. Like it was just a completely different like year for them. Some advice that I have for future BRVGS students is to pick a topic that you are passionate about and that you are very interested in. Not only does it make it easier to want to do it and want to go out and find ways to intern and community service and everything like that, but it makes it easier to present to other people having passion about what you want to do and just enjoying talking about something is way more easier than having a topic that's not as interesting to you. I have learned a lot about special education throughout this project, but I've also learned a lot about myself. Um, as I said before, I've always been interested in helping special education students, but I wasn't 100% sure if that was everything that I wanted to do. But after seeing the impact that I can make with just a small project like this, I know that that's what I want to do in the future. And I'm not exactly sure where I would like to go to college, but I hope to attend a university and major in special education. and improve the system my whole life. Um, thank you guys for listening today and thank you to both my senior advisors for helping me and all of my mentors for making this possible. Um, I really appreciate it and I'm glad that I got to have this opportunity. Yes, Devin. For me, honestly, was not necessarily like special education and stuff, but like the idea of an internship and this whole project, like I've never really done anything like that before. I've always, like I've helped with things, but I've never had to actually like meet with somebody and like officially create a internship. Like starting that, and yes, that's where some of my struggles were, because as I said, I had an issue with an internship that I wanted, but the intern had to cancel on me at the last second, and it was just kind of like a, I like kind of went into panic mode and learning that, you know, there's always a way around things, obviously, but how important it is to have a backup plan and like everyone's saying, start early and have kind of your stuff set in stone was kind of like a learning experience for me. Yeah, um, I haven't talked to the SEA. I will, I will, I mean, I need to, but I have talked to the OC Fanatics because I'm an officer for that club. And so I was posting about it on our social media pages and stuff, kind of trying to get the word out. And since like I, as an officer, like I get to choose like who will run it next year and stuff, I'm definitely going to make sure that they're included and we shouldn't just be posting about others, like we should be including them in that too. But talking to the SEA is definitely, a good idea. Yes. Given that in your project you were able to mold that all to the levels of special education, like elementary, middle, and high school, did this help you to go out with the levels you want to work in? <laughs> I want to say yes, but I don't think I can. I literally, like, I enjoy it all so much that I truly don't know what level I want to work on yet. I, like, yes, there were moments that I loved more than others, but each class was amazing like I I couldn't pick one yet <laughs> yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Curious Home begins to talk about the initiative, Developing Leaders for Tomorrow. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you all for being here. My name is Darius Holmes, and this is the initiative. So my project is about mentorship in youth in underserved communities and just the program that I came up with to help combat the problems with youth. So why I chose to do my project on mentorship of youth in underserved communities is over the summer, I was actually asked to volunteer at Boys and Girls Club. And while talking with some of the staff, they, uh, the general consensus was that they had two problems within Boys and Girls Club. One was that the fourth and fifth graders were really like having issues. And then um, the other issue was that they felt that something was missing in their program that, would, that could take them to another level of mentorship. And I just felt like I could be the piece to come and uh, get, like resolve their issue. So I decided to do my internship at Boys and Girls Club because if I want to attack the issue, I might as well do it head on right at the place. And I did it. My mentor was uh, the unit director for Boys and Girls Club of Orange County, uh, James Miller. Um, so for my internship, I started off with like the behind the scenes. So I started looking at like budgeting because they're a nonprofit. So everything has to go down to a budget. Everything has to be used. They use it for like things around the club, like equipment, utilities, and then just the planning of like field trips. And then like they have like STEM nights and different types of things that they do. And then once I got more comfortable, I started doing things more like hands on. So I was doing things around the club, like tasks that he would do every day as the director of a mentor program. I would set up the gym, set up different things around the club like for them to do and just be more hands-on and shadowing him with what he was doing. Um, so while doing this, a big question came up of what, what are the best methods for mentoring youth in underserved communities? And looking at like UVA databases and doing my own research, I found that the three best methods were building connections early. So instead of just being a mentor straight on, um, building like a connection with the like the students to where like they trust you more um using high school and high schoolers and young adults to be the mentors because that's somebody who can almost be like a big brother or big sister to these students and almost like make them feel more comfortable and want to like like follow the guidance and then lastly is having like a stable like schedule like a kid that you're only seeing them maybe once and then like they don't know when you're coming back like it almost gives them like a sense of not being wanted so that sense of like feeling comfortable with knowing that you'll be back like it gives them a want to follow you. Um, so I didn't want to just like hold myself to just um, like research. So I wanted to do like an in-person and this is Mr. Chantel Hopkins who I did my interview on. He's a former director of Boys and Girls Club and now he is a mentor for um, incarcerated youth. And I interviewed him about like, what are his experience with mentorship? Uh, what are the struggles? And just different things like that. Just trying to pick his brain about um, his experiences of mentorship. And he gave me a lot of insightful answers. Like every question, I mean, he really went in depth about what he was saying. And through my research and the interview, it allowed me to use these in my, um, in my community service. And I decided to do my community service at Boys and Girls Club as well, because I felt like my presence was needed there for the whole experience in order to, like, in order to bring my solution to the club. Um, again, I did it with the unit director, James Miller. Um, he was actually very excited to do both the internship and the community service because he felt that I was doing something that would, would be very impactful to his club. Um, so through my community service, I actually worked with a former, I mean, a fellow, a fellow uh, governor school student, Johan Sullivan. And it's actually kind of cool how we have two completely different projects, but we were able to bring them together in order to do our community service. So we started out with the, like working with the kids at the club and towards the beginning, they were kind of like very misbehaved. Like they were cussing, fighting, like stuff that you wouldn't expect for the fifth graders to be doing. So it really opened my eyes to the problems that they were talking about at the beginning. 
But we were just there to build connections, just talk to the kids, just be there for them, um, like do activities and stuff with them. And then uh, we started like helping them like with like homework and like schoolwork and like really getting them engaged into actually doing their schoolwork. Because that was another problem that they were having is that they just weren't really interested in like coming to the club to do like school. Like they were actually coming to the club just to have fun and mess around. But we actually opened their eyes to why doing their schoolwork is actually important. Um, so through my community service, I feel like I impacted a lot of people and that's where my legacy is. But I also have created a program with Johan Sullivan called The Initiative. And it's basically a mentor program ran by high school students. And um, so that, and we just wanted to use my three points of research in order to um, like make the club. And these two right here, this is Calvin Bragg. This is Calvin Bragg right here and then Kimani Dinkins and they're underclassmen. And I just wanted to use them in my program because once me and Johan leave off to go to college, there are two people who are interested in the program and would carry it on past when we're gone. And right here, I was just, this is just me describing to them like how the program will work, what they need to take the next steps once we're going to continue the program and just how it will work as a whole. Um, so what I learned about myself is that, um, like I don't really take failure well, like doing, like messing up, like I really don't take that well. But this year I had to learn that like failing isn't really the end of it. Like um, failing is just like a setback for a major comeback. So like when things don't go your way, like don't just like get down on yourself. Like it'll, it'll come in its own time. And my advice to future governor school students for their senior project is to just take the failure and just like go with it. Because a lot of people in governor school, they're not really used to like, like they're used to being at a high level, like they're used to doing everything like the right way. But in this, there's gonna be things that you've never seen before. So you will have failure, you will struggle. And I just wanna advise them to not let the struggle like tear them down and just to keep progressing through the project as they go. Um, so my future plan is to attend Virginia Tech and major in civil engineering. And I also would like to continue in the future to be a part of my program, the initiative, and just continue to help and be a part of the club and continue to like, like bring my help to what's going on. Um, so there are quite a few people I would like to thank. Um, I would like to thank James Miller, uh, the Boys and Girls Club staff and the kids for just welcoming me and allowing me to be a part of their program and do my project there and just being so open and making me feel welcome. Um, I like to thank John Sullivan for bringing a project that he did that has nothing to do with what I'm doing, but we found a way to like gel it together and make a community service and a legacy that I believe will be impactful for many years to come. Um, and I would like to thank Mr. Chantel Hopkins for sitting down with me and doing the interview. Um, he actually reached out to Mr. James Miller and asked to do the interview because He's seen how passionate I was about this and he's seen the impact and the change that I can make within the community. Um, I would like to thank Calvin Bragg and Kimani Dingus for being so like interested in wanting to be a part of this program and wanting and showing signs of wanting to carry this program on past when me and Johan can't be here continuously to run it. Um, I would like to thank Ms. Hernan and Ms. Carlton for and all of Governor School for giving uh, us the not just me, but the rest of my classmates just the opportunity and the platform to show something and be a part of something that we're passionate in and then I would like to thank you all for being here one more time I like to thank you judges for being here and at this time I'll be taking any questions So it's actually something that Mr. Shanta Hopkins talked a lot about because he said that most of the kids that are incarcerated and if he believes that they ha if they had a mentor like at an early age they would have grown to be like better in society and he feels that since they didn't those kids normally don't have people growing up that are always there for them like they usually have like a one parent home they usually have a even if it is a one parent home it's a one parent where the other parent isn't always there so they're just kind of uh, going through life on their own. 
And normally when you go, like when people go through life on their own, they normally don't make the best decisions. So he feels that uh, if they had a mentor or a program to go through when they were younger, that they might would have gone through life in a better way. Uh, what kind of support is the mentorship program providing? What kind of things are the, the mentors doing? There's a little bit more to that. Yeah, so um, especially with the fourth or fifth grade kids, like they really aren't like the the staff at Boys and Girls Club is saying that they really can't get like to them. Like like they can't they, they can't like get them to a point where their like their behavior will change or they'll start seeing school better. But like they even said like one of the staff members and Mr. James Miller said that like once me once Johan and I started coming to the club, like they seen progression. Like the the cousin, like the foulings they were using that normal fourth and fifth graders don't use, like that was going down. Like they weren't fighting, like the fighting wasn't happening anymore. And they were just more interested in coming to the club, um, like getting their lunch, doing schoolwork after, and then like doing the fun activities afterwards. All right, so my name is Lorelai Bradley, and for my project, I did the psychological effects of firefighting specifically on women. So a little bit about me. I started firefighting for at my local fire department, Orange County Fire Department, as a volunteer. I grew um, an immense passion for firefighting, and I knew that I wanted to choose something for my project that I could be passionate about because it would help me like get through it. Um, I did struggle a lot in firefighting due to my gender, not just physically. I think physical, it was harder for me because I'm smaller and I was the youngest in my department. I was the only active firefighter as a woman in my department. So it was definitely harder for me, but mentally it took a toll, um, a traumatic toll in many different ways, not just because I was the only girl but also what you have to go through. And I wanted to make sure women could have somebody they could come to and not go through some of the things that I went through. So a uh, statistic, 55, 57% of firefighters struggle with their, physic, their psychological health. Um, that's not just women, it's in all. There's a very high rate of suicide for firefighters and all um responders which i definitely wanted to touch base on because it is not okay and i wanted to create something for these women so they could have a means of support throughout their experience and i wanted to encourage women to join because there is a lack of women in the fire industry there has been some growth over the past few years recently however there has been a decline entirely for men and women. So for my internship, I interned at the Orange County Fire Department, the volunteer fire department. Through that, I was able to run calls as any other firefighter would. Um, I also did business meetings and I would meet at the fire department every Monday around like seven o'clock. Um, I was able to get over 50 hours during my internship, which was very great because it gave me like everything I needed to get through. Um, and I could personally experience everything for myself instead of just researching and trying to understand, I actually went through it personally. Um, not only did I have business meetings there, but I also did um, training and 
we did lectures and stuff, and I was able to speak to each firefighter, volunteer firefighter individually. Um, but I wished I could talk more to women because I was the only one at the time. Um, my mentors on the left, that is my assistant chief, um, Bert Roby, and then on the right is Whit Jacobs. He is our fire chief right now. He's younger, which I think helped because there's a lack of youth in the fire department. Um, I was the youngest, and it was very hard for me because everybody was past, they were career firefighters, and they had retired and they couldn't do it anymore so they still wanted to help so they were volunteer but they were all old so <laughs> I wanted um so it was very nice to have Wit there because he was somebody closer in my age even though he has his own family and he's older but I really appreciated them because they took time out of their jobs their families and everybody else in the department to help me with my project and sit with me and talk to me about different things and try to help me whenever I was struggling because I didn't have that support. Um, the impact that my internship made, it gave me a full understanding of what it means to be a firefighter rather than just have the idea in my head. I've always known that it's hard like physically because it's a firefighter, like you're running into fires and everything, but it showed me how mentally challenging it can be, not just to have to run into a fire and save somebody, but I had to make decisions on saving a child's life or not saving that child's life because I could die in the process, but also to run a fire call and not know what you expect and to show up and to actually see in person a dead body and have to carry them and get them the help that they need or not be able to help. And then following that, not knowing what happens after you leave the scene was extremely hard for me. And I actually had to stop going on calls because I couldn't, I couldn't get the images out of my head that I went on and I never knew what I was going to expect every time I ran a call. Um, so for my research, I wanted to specifically research women and it was so hard to find stuff because there aren't many women, like I said. So I had to mainly go through like, instead of a website or like research I wanted to go, I had to actually mainly use my internships, which was hard, but it definitely helped a lot. And it made for a more significant thing because it came personally from people in areas so close and local to me so it was really crazy to understand what all these women were going through and to hopefully help them so for my internship these are some of the women there's also men in there i did interview men as well but these are some of the women i interviewed i interviewed about 15 different people um after my first interview which was required i got a lot from it and I knew I had to do more. So I continued to interview women and I had 35 questions. I asked everybody, they normally ranged about two hours long, some were in person, some were over the phone and some were like just a Google me interview. Um, but I was able to see that some women were the only one in their department and they felt they had more support from the men because it was just them, but other women were alone and they felt like they couldn't go to their departments anymore because there was a lack of support within their department. So for my community service, I worked at the Albemarle County Fire Department to create a support group for these women. Um, so they had somewhere to go and somebody to talk to. Um, I worked with Suzanne Her Herndon Couser. She is a very big part of firefighting, definitely with women because there aren't many and she actually is very well known around the area. She um, is a volunteer at Albemarle County, but I'm pretty sure she just switched to Loudoun County, which is really great because she's still making an impact around. And she was there for me before my internship, but I didn't know her on a personal level. 
and I got to through this. Um, I wasn't meet, able to meet with her in person very often because she's very busy. She has a family, a career, and she volunteers. Um, but we did do Google Meets, and I spent quite often online with her. Um, this is the flyer that we created. So our plan for my community service, we wanted to first, um, in, after the interviews, we wanted to create a survey similar to interview questions um, to see where people are and then see their interest, if they actually wanted to attend our group or not, and we briefly explained what it was. And then um, we wanted to provide things for them so that they had, but we also wanted to make it somewhat local because all of the fire departments are about like 30, 15 minutes within distance from each other. So we wanted to make somewhere where they didn't have to commute so far. Um, the impact that it made, um, the turnout was pretty good. Honestly, um, we posted the flyers throughout our departments, me and Ms. Herndon's, but we also asked other local departments if we could post ours there so then everybody could see and we encouraged the women and tried to talk to them and like um, posted some stuff online as well. So we did get like a small turnout, but it was better than I expected due to the lack of women in all of the departments. Um, so I was really appreciative for that, and um, I'm still in contact with some of the women now. It went on for a month. I think we had four meetings from November to December, um, and I wish I could have done more, and I really hope to do more, but I'm still in contact with the women, and we still call, and I also found a hotline for firefighters, not specifically women, but somewhere they could call if they're really struggling and we can't meet, um, but I have called a few of them and they have thanked me personally, and it's really good to know that I actually made a difference amongst them. Um, some advice for future BRVGS seniors. Um, like everybody's saying, start early, because it's really hard to keep up with it if you're behind. But I would also say take pictures. Um, I got a lot of pictures during my internship, but not so much my community service. Um, some of it was I didn't want to, like, make people feel uncomfortable taking pictures during that sort of support group because it's very vulnerable and I didn't want them to be uncomfortable. But also when you're in the moment, you don't want to just stand up and take a picture. But I want to, like, I think be in the back of your mind that you need to take pictures because it's really important to show the difference you made through photos. Um, my personal growth, I was able to not just through my project push myself but also personally i could i did more than i ever thought i could and i didn't think i could be a firefighter um and i also helped other people in a way i never thought i could definitely because they're older than me and i'm so young i felt like i actually still made a difference which i didn't think i would be able to do because i feel like i'm not like that to them and they're that to me. So it was like really good to see that I'm actually making a difference to them. Um, my future plans, I'm not 100% sure yet, but I'm pretty sure I will be a class of 2028 at Virginia Military Institute where I will be doing um, ROTC and Air Force ROTC. And prior to graduation, I will get my mechanical engineering degree and I will do officer training school, and then I will serve as an officer in the United States Air Force. Thank you. Um, well, we have, so right now there's a system technically, I don't know if it's just at our department, but after a call, depending on what it is, well, after every single fire and after most calls, we do have a sit down with everybody that ran on that call because not every member goes and you speak about that and you try to talk through it. But a lot of people don't do it because they're older and they think they don't need to. 
but you can tell they're struggling. So most times every Monday when we meet after those, um, some people will stay behind. And that was like a good time for everybody to like talk about personal experiences. And that's how I learned a lot about other people. So I think that was a really great for them and for me and everybody to talk about what they were going through, not just at the support group. Yeah. Sadie? encourage yeah um I think it's really difficult I feel like at any age you're vulnerable to that kind of thing like it doesn't matter how old you are it's going to make an effect so I feel like there should be we have um firefighter one courses but those are textbook and physical aspect I think there should be a class for the mental aspect to sort of prepare you more for the things that you see because even though you think about it it's still unexpected to see so I would hope they would incorporate that somehow into like learning in the future. Um, but as young as 16, you can start volunteer firefighting, which is when I did. And even though I got a lot from it and I'm very passionate about it and I love it, I don't recommend maybe going in that young. Um, but volunteer can be really good because you don't have to go on calls and you don't have to do that stuff. You can just hang out around the environment and still learn about firefighting. And then maybe once you get older or you decide to go to career, you can go more into that more difficult stuff. Jackson? So going along with that kind of, I know you can support people if you're not working on it, but what do you think can be done to move forward more youth and more women to go into the fire? Um, I think just showing like like how I made my support group, just showing that there are other women and that there are young people in the industry because when I went in, it was hard because there wasn't. But whenever I went to other neighboring county fire departments and I found those younger people, those other women, it was very like touching to see them and I got to connect with them. So instead of like feeling alone, I had other people. So to give um, younger people and women experience with people like them, and of the same age and gender, they would be able to see like how great it can be with people that young, and then they could want to do it themselves, if that makes sense. Um, I wasn't able to find much on it. I really did try to see if I could, but I couldn't find much. Um, there was definitely nothing local. Um, I did find the hotline, so that was very convenient but nothing specific to support groups at least not in my in the area around here thank you Next is Hannah Turner and Forever Comes with Adoption. Welcome guys. Um, I'm Hannah Turner. I did I just chose to work with animals because I love animals. I've grown up with animals my entire life. It can truly be a best friend to everyone. And working with animals, I really got to experience like what they go through, what they've been through, and how much difference we can make in an animal's life and how much difference an animal can make in our life.
So for my research, I chose, I did what are the best methods to get animals adopted from animal shelters. And I learned that the three best methods are to use social media to appeal to people's emotions and, sorry, and to make the process easy. So by making the process easy and appealing to people's emotions and using social media, people were actually, uh, people were actually able to adopt animals and you know, see the process and look online before and get a good idea of what they want. So for my internship, I worked at Orange County Animal Shelter with Gina Jenkins. There I was able to do um, all sorts of things. I gave dogs baths, I walked dogs, I worked with a lot of special animals, and I, I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with all of these animals, and I felt like I made a big difference in these animals' lives, just seeing them every single day. Um, working with them. I did a lot of work with certain animals. Um, like these two dogs, they came in about a week before I got there and they were very socially awkward. They were neglected. They were left behind a barn as puppies. And when I got there, they wouldn't come near me. They, they were scared. They were very skittish and it was just awful to see. After about a week or two of working with them, you can see he is eating a tree out of my hand. So it was very, very impactful for me to see the difference I was making in these animals' lives and how much animal shelters actually do for these animals. It was just amazing to see these dogs, after two weeks, were able to walk up and eat out of my hands. I spent a lot of time with these dogs, so I, get, I did get really close with a few of them, and it was very cool to see. I mean, dogs have personalities, and it's really cool to see that and work with them. I also spent a little time with cats. They have a cat room, so it was very nice to hang out with cats. We didn't really do much. It was more of just sitting there, playing with them, petting them, um, throwing some toys around, just giving them some time to get out of their kennel, give them some one-on-one -on -one reaction. So for my internship, I did Friends of Orange County Animal Shelter. So they are an organization um, where um, about every Saturday they go to PetSmart in Fredericksburg or Culpeper. They bring a bunch of dogs and a few cats and they set them up. Um, I worked with Allison Abbs, she was my mentor. She's actually the woman who started this organization in order to help Orange County Animal Shelter get the animals adopted and work with these animals. So um, every Saturday we would load the dogs up and bring them to PetSmart. We started with um, bringing them there, walking them, letting them get comfortable with the area because you know it's, it's a new area, it's different for them. We would bring them there. Um, we would already have the kennel set up and with food and water next to them, which is not pictured. Um, and then we had little name tags. So each little name tag had their names, their breed, the animals, some fun little facts about them interests they like, things, you know, a little bit about their personality. And it was cool to work at PetSmart because people were actually able to come in, play with these dogs. I mean, it was wonderful seeing all the kids that just walked by and would sit there for like an hour while their parents shopped. They would sit there and play with these animals. So whether or not they were adopting them, it still gave these animals a great chance to just have some one-on-one -on -one interaction. And it was really cool to see the kids, like how much they lit up, how much these animals lit up, just working with them. So um, my impact is actually for the Orange County, um, Friends of Orange County Animal Shelter, I am uh, redoing their website. So I do not have a picture of it because it is not currently done, but I am taking their website and redoing their donation page. So that way, instead of, it was set up to where it was just, you go to PayPal and you pay. Instead, um, my mom runs nonprofit companies, so she is helping me set up like a organization where they can go in, they can do donations um, yearly, monthly, I mean, however they choose, they can do donations and list off how these donations make a, dif make a difference. Um, one of the things I did learn about myself is that I procrastinate like crazy. I felt so far behind. And I wasn't behind. I was actually ahead of schedule. I just felt insanely behind because I was stressed out. I did not plan my stuff out very well like I should have. So one of the things I did learn about myself is um, that and I need to work on time management. It was extremely hard for me because I was doing school and I was also working every day after school. So I had to rearrange my work schedule and 
actually cut into some of my school hours so I could do this. I did this every Wednesday and Friday. I would leave after third block and I would I would go to the animal shelter. And then Saturdays I would go to PetSmart. So this is me and my mentor actually having a conversation about when I could do this, when I'd be available, everything like that. So for the younger generation, I definitely recommend starting early. It is a big thing just to not necessarily even just starting your internship in your community service, but to plan it ahead of time. Plan it, go ahead and get it done. I mean, have your thoughts planned out. Definitely keep an organizer. That way you can check off what you've already done, what you need to do, everything like that. It's very important to keep yourself organized and keep yourself calm while doing this. Otherwise, I know it's very easy to get overwhelmed and feel behind when you're not. So after school, I actually am planning on going to a trade school. It is a eight month long trade school where seven months of it, I will be online. And the eighth month, I actually go to Minnesota to do nuclear training. So for it is American Institution of Non-Destructive Testing and non-destructive testing is a inspecting of metal. So I get to inspect metal, I get to do ultrasounds, x-rays, um, water testing. I get to do all sorts of uh, testing on metal that I mean, like aircraft, it need, it cannot have any cracks or seals or anything like that. So it's very cool to test metal for me. Thank you. So no one has ever heard of it. So actually, my oldest brother went into the Marines for welding. So when he came out of welding, he was actually a welding inspector. And so this goes hand in hand with welding inspectors. So he switched over to this and he actually works for Spirit Airlines. He inspects every part that goes in their plane. So he runs a robot about half the size of this room that goes over the panels on the plane. And he started talking to me about it one day um, about six months ago, and it really hit me. And he would call me and show me all the work he was able to do and everything. And it really fascinated me because I always, I love being hands-on. I love, love all that stuff. So I found a trade school for it, and I'm going to live with him while I do it, actually. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I would say helping animals get adopted. I know not many did get adopted, but um, just seeing the animals get adopted, because while I was there, I want to say about 10 animals got adopted in about two months, which wasn't a lot, but it was more than it has been in the past. Okay, that's good to know. So thank you for our part for watching and please continue. Yes, thank you. Most definitely. I actually, I actually tried to adopt an animal. <laughs> it was very terrible. I had, there was a beautiful pit bull and I was going to adopt it. But when I brought my pit bull in, I already had, I already have two animals. So when I brought my animals in to do a meet and greet, they did not get along. So I was not able to get the dog. Yeah, but I've gotten all of my animals from the that animal shelter. So that was really cool, me working with them. Did I meet the timeline? All right, we're going to take a 20 minute break.
Okay. It'll be fine. Okay. Um, just remember that down is next, like when you're editing your slideshow. Okay. You go back, click that one, and then this is the little pointer thing. Okay. The most important thing is to yeah. <laughs> deprive it. It's hard to fix. Okay. Right. It's, it's just okay. Is Miss Schumann on her way down here? I didn't have a heart attack. Anna's thought she's going to have a heart attack. Nothing happened. Nobody said that. That means really hard. Kind of just care about it. Just away from it. We love it. Okay. Yeah. A few years ago, that might have been you. Not me. I remember the ones last year. Yeah. I don't watch one time. <laughs> Everyone was panicking all the seniors I had. No. Yeah. Okay, moving to our next session with our very in astronomy education for younger students. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. My presentation today, I decided to focus on astronomy. My name is Skyra Jerry, and I wanted to focus on education for younger students because throughout the Orange County school system, I only remember having about one unit on space science, and that was in eighth grade. And I wanted to provide an opportunity for students that I did not have myself. I started out my project by interning at George Mason University in Fairfax. I did this in late September with Professor Plavchan. I was there for about nine hours. We could only do one day because he had a very busy schedule. So during my internship, I really just followed him around lectures. Uh, he had a few senior observational astronomy classes, which were really helpful to watch. And I got to see the methods that he used for teaching. And by seeing those, I utilized them later on in my community service. And later during the day, I was able to participate in the Astronomy Public Night, where they opened the campus observatory, which is one of the best in Virginia. It has one of the most powerful telescopes, where um, students who were just starting out their astronomy careers and those in the public who wanted to learn about astronomy were able to come in. And it was all student volunteer led. So they were able to look through the telescope and be taught things by the student volunteers. And it was just a really helpful experience for me. I also did a second internship at Georgetown University. Um, this was in early October. Um, I interned with Professor Van Curen, who was the head of the physics department at Georgetown. Uh, I was there for about eight hours, or sorry, four hours. And I sat in on a lot of his lectures and a few club meetings. And we had like a one-on-one -on -one conversation because he is a physics teacher. It was a lot more astrophysics based rather than astronomy. And I wanted, I asked him a lot of questions about how the best ways to teach physics, which is a pretty difficult subject to younger students. So we kind of dumbed it down, isn't the right word, but like made it simpler for the students to understand for my community service. Here's the observatory where we worked at Georgetown. Uh, so for my research, my main question, I wanted to find the best methods, the most effective and efficient methods to uh, present this education to younger students. I found that it was mostly important to educate the younger students because 
uh, memory retention is a lot higher at a younger age, and there were a lot of misconceptions found. Um, a few studies found that when I think sixth and seventh graders were prompted questions like basic astronomy questions, such as where does the sun go at night, a lot of them, about 20% of them, were incorrect with their answers. And after intervention, they had about 85% correct. And the best method, one of the most important methods is visual aids because observational astronomy is very observational. So it's best to utilize such as asking students to look at the moon phases and see things for themselves, which is, it gives them a sense of responsibility and independence while also educating them further. And introducing conceptual background. So basically how astronomy began, where it originated, maybe like the ancient calendars and whatnot, it really just helps them provide a stronger background for their education. So I did two community service uh, opportunities. My first was with Miss Emily Poole at Locust Grove Middle School. And my second was with Miss Davis Barkley at George Mason University. So I started at Locust Grove Middle School. I wanted to, again, provide this opportunity to younger students. So I began an after school astronomy club where students were asked to Students were asked to participate if they wanted to, if they had an interest in earth science that they weren't able to educate themselves on in school with the single units that they're usually taught. So the sessions usually began out where we would have instructional period and I would have slideshows about slideshows with a lot of visual aids about certain topics, like each day was a different topic. First we learned about planets, we did like a little recap of what they learned. And then it moved on to galaxy formations, nebula. And after a few times, we started taking suggestions, like what they wanted to learn next. And the second part of the club meetings were usually like the interactive and creative section. This gave students the ability to show what they knew, show what they learned. So here's an example. We made planets, and this specific student made a gas planet. Um, he demonstrated his understanding by he even listed at the bottom that the atmosphere was 80% nitrogen, 15% oxygen. And you can see the ring around it because we talked about um, rings around gas planets as a commonality. And I was actually invited back to George Mason University for my second community service research. And instead of just participating in the public nights, I was allowed to lead the public nights. So I was one of the volunteers. And this was an amazing opportunity because we had about four groups in total. So I spent four hours, four to five hours here, and two of the groups were Boy and Girl Scouts, which was the perfect age range, and they had a lot of questions. They were very curious. They thought it was amazing to see the moon at such like an enlarged scale from the telescope. And throughout the sessions, they started asking a lot more questions, and even the parents themselves didn't know some pretty basic astronomy facts, so they started asking questions as well. And it was really amazing to just watch them begin to grasp the concepts a lot more. And during this community service, I was able to learn how to maneuver the telescope and how to communicate the resources effectively to the students. So my future plans are to go to UVA and continue my astronomy education. And I'm hoping for my legacy, I'm, the club meetings haven't happened for a little while because it was too cold, but in the spring, we're gonna come back, I'm gonna continue my club meetings, and we're gonna do outside sessions when the moon is in view, and I'm gonna bring my telescope and have them use the telescope. And I'm hoping that I can create a connection between George Mason University and the younger students because George Mason was very accepting to me. They're really happy to have me there and they want more younger students to come experience that. And living in Orange County, there's no like observatory here. So I want to create connections for the students that I taught and I want them to be able to have an opportunity to go to the observatory and see for themselves. Um, it was really amazing just watching the students like gain more interest because they came in, they knew they were interested, but they didn't really know what they wanted to do with this knowledge. And they started asking a lot more questions. Like they would talk to me about things that they saw in movies and ask me if it was correct. And we were able to use models to kind of depict how the solar system works, especially the moon and sun cycle. And they even, a few of them came back to me and were like, oh, I looked at the moon tonight. Why did it look like this today and this the next day? And it was just really interesting to see like how their brains work and how they connected more. I want to say thank you to all my advisors and everyone who came out today. Um, and thank you to Mr. Weinset. I interviewed with him and he gave me a lot of information. 
about how Orange County doesn't have a lot of physics opportunities. He was my physics teacher. And yeah, just thank you for being here. Um, some advice for the younger classes of Blue Ridge. Do not procrastinate. I know that teachers say this, but it, your senior year is going to be really hard. And it's best for you to get a head start. And also, don't be afraid of rejection. Because you're going to have to reach out to a lot of people, depending on what your community service and your internships are. Don't be afraid to reach out and do something that you're really passionate about. Because it makes the project a lot more fun for you and educational. And yeah, <laughs> does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Uh, how many times is the club um, so it began in mid-November, and we met every Monday and Tuesday until winter break. So I think in total we had about eight club sessions. How many people participated in the session? Um, so for the sessions we had, I think the max number was eight. Um, and then, but for the George Mason, those sessions, there were about 40 to 60 people a group. Um, I knew that George Mason beforehand had a really good observatory, so I reached out to Professor Plavchan. I think I talked to their like community liaison, and I they directed me to Professor Plavchan. And then I'm pretty sure it was Miss Herndon who <laughs> encouraged me to reach out like further because there were a few times where I was trying to get into contact with NASA, but they have like this whole application process, and it's really difficult to get an internship without this whole process. So she was like, "Oh, what do you? What about like?" surrounding schools in the area. And I was like, okay. So I talked to George Mason and I talked to Georgetown. I wasn't expecting Georgetown to reply, but it was really a great opportunity. I'm really thankful for it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what role do you think the time is like responsible like the economy as it is like the United States is kind of like like do you think there's a role for it in elementary school? I think I did actually talk to a few. I reached out to both Locust Grove Middle School and the elementary school, as well as Jessica Sarver, the STEM coordinator of our county. And she believed that in elementary school, it might be a little bit too early for them to learn about astronomy because a lot of it is like basic physics based and it might be better for them to learn basic science before moving on to that. So they thought that the middle school was a better level for it. But just keeping this club going, I'm planning on coming back next year when I have time and especially I'm going to continue internshipping at George Mason when I have time because that it dies off in the winter, but it comes back in the spring. Yes. Um, I haven't started doing that yet because the observational team at George Mason is kind of like on break since they don't do it in the winter. So I'm pretty sure in the spring quarter they begin resuming that and I want to reach out to them. And I have a few connections. I was really grateful that a lot of the volunteers gave me like their phone number and were like, if you have any questions, if you want to come back, if you have other people who want to come back. So I'm hoping to make connections throughout multiple counties because I know that this isn't just an issue in Orange County. Thank you. Once everybody goes by. <laughs> we want them all to sit down before you go because it ties, okay? Yeah, that's fine. Take it right there. And then just remember that down is next, mm -hmm. right? So if you go back, it's right here. Okay. This is the little pointer, right? Okay. Remember to breathe. You need to Mm -hmm. So up is back, that's yeah, forward. Down is next. Okay. 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 
Mm-hmm. Right now. Moving on, we've gone to Leaf, the world's greatest drug. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? My name is Jonathan Litz. Uh, my project, as Ms. Hernandez just said, is music, the world's greatest drug. Now, um, I have a few different reasons for the reason why I wanted to do this project. Uh, the first is um, I've always been, I've always loved music. It's always been an incredibly important part of my life in every single extracurricular activity I've ever done. Anything along those lines, music has always somehow been involved. Um, and the the brain portion, I've always found the brain interesting. Um, when I was in second grade, my dad had a stroke. Um, and while that was an incredibly sad event, uh, it did open up my brain to a lot of uh, different opportunities that come with researching and studying the brain, just seeing the way he interacted with his doctors. Um, so for my research question, I wanted to answer a very simple question. What ways can music improve the everyday lives of individuals and specifically i was looking at people with disabilities and people with mental health issues um, i was able to find a lot of different resources covering many different uh, uh, things like different mental health conditions uh, and different disabilities and something that i actually found to be even more promising than uh, the repercussions for mental health treatment is um, the possibilities that it has for the treatment of physical health conditions as well, especially as it applies to things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all these kinds of terminal illnesses um, that we think of as being untreatable. And once you get it, you're, you have no hope. Um, I was able to, with a lot of my research, uh, talk to both Ms. Satterwhite and Ms. Somar, the band and choir teachers here at Orange County High School. Um, while they are not exactly as versed in um, the psychological aspect, they are um, very well versed in the world of music. And they've done some of their own uh, private research into the matter as well. And so they were able to help me a lot and guide me through a lot of these different questions that I have had as I was starting out. Um, for my internship, I originally was going to uh, try and do my internship with um, the music therapy department at the Shenandoah Conservatory at Shenandoah University, because um, they have one of the best programs in the country. And I have a connection uh, with someone who went to the music therapy school uh, at Shenandoah, and she's right there, her name is Sarah Garner. I originally reached out um, and she gave me contact information at Shenandoah. Um, the person that I contacted was actually on sabbatical. So uh, not having another option there, I ended up actually going, reaching out to Sarah and seeing if she had any opportunities that I could help her with. And through an organization called Step VA, which she's incredibly um, involved with, I was able um, to fill up, do my internship with her. Now, what is Step VA? Step VA is an organization that is dedicated to enriching the lives of, individu of individuals with sensory issues and other disabilities through music and arts. Um, you can see here, this was the first event for Step VA that I ever attended. It was an open mic night at the University of Mary Washington. Um, I did not do a lot of interacting. I was mostly just standing in the back. Um, I was controlling the songs that people were singing. Um, Walking into that room was a very um, interesting experience. It's not something like I've ever, ever experienced before because every single person in that room perceived the world around them completely differently than every single other person in that room. Um, working with these students uh, requires a lot of flexibility and a lot of ability to uh, try and just remember that they are not experiencing the world the same way that you or I would experience it. Um, this was another one of the first things that I did with them. Again, just shadowing, kind of watching from the back, there was a drum circle, a series of classes um, where they were able to just, they all came in, they played on drums to music and just seeing the music change the way that they 
their entire demeanor, their entire kind of outlook on the way things were going was incredible to see take hold. Um, here you can see a choir performance. Um, again, the the things that were that happened in their brains once the music came on, once they were able to get lost in that, is truly incredible. Um, being able to see them do things like this, go in front of a crowd of random people. This was at the mall in Fredericksburg. And a crowd of people who they did not know, knew nothing about them, and get up there and perform, and just like no one was watching, was absolutely incredible. It wasn't until a little later on in the process that I started to actually do some hands-on work with some of the students. Um, I had to receive sensory training in order to even be able to work with them because there's a lot of ish, uh, different things that you need to take into consideration. And if you aren't aware of the things that might happen while working with them, uh, things can go downhill very quickly. Um, but as I started to work with them, I began to form relationships with a lot of these students. And I began to realize that it's very easy to think of these people as people that are completely different. And while, yes, their perceptions are different, they are still people. They still feel emotions the same way we do. They still see, hear, feel things the way we do. They just express it in a very different way from everyone else around them. And one way that helps them immensely to express their feelings and express these emotions is through the music and the theater that they were doing um, at um, Sep VA. Uh, by the end, I was able to lead classes uh, along with my mentor, Sarah, um, that were dedicated. This class in particular was dedicated to dance. So just playing some music, getting their bodies moving. Of course, exercise is very good for the body, and doing it to music is even better. Um, this has since translated into uh, I am now stage managing and core choreographing a uh, musical production that they are currently working on right now. Um, that I will continue working with them on that until April. Um, for my community service, I did I completed my community service with a student at Orange County High School uh, named Carrie Kessner. Uh, our two projects were very different. Mine focused on music and hers focused on movement. And it was actually Miss Herndon uh, one day in her class who recommended to us that we should maybe do something together because you know, if you're at the gym, you're gonna wear headphones, you're gonna listen to music. So like, why can't we do something? So we ended up reaching out to Gail Collier at Dogwood Village, an assisted living facility here in Orange, um, town of Orange. And we were able to complete um, our community service at Dogwood. Some of it was together and we also did something separately. Um, at first it was a little hard to get things off the ground. Um, we were both very busy with extracurricular activities so we were actually not able to start our community service until November. Um, but thanks to Gail and Dogwood they were very accommodating and very uh, willing to work with us and both of our very busy schedules. Um, so at Dogwood, one of the primary things that both Carrie and I participated in was an activity called Moving to the Music. Uh, in Moving to the Music, we would, we would do a variety of things, but the core focus of it was just with these elderly residents, who many of whom did not have uh, much time left on this earth. <laughs> um, we were able to just get their bodies moving. We were able to see them smile, um, seeing their faces light up, Every single time we entered a room was nothing short of magical. Um, it, it's incredibly uh, fulfilling to see that someone who, especially someone that's not in a, the best situation that someone could be in in life, to see them have that reaction to you. It's an incredible experience. Um, some of the other things I did at Dogwood, I helped uh, with uh, this was a Christmas party that they held. Um, I helped, they caroled, they had food. It was, and when they Christmas caroled, everyone was singing along, having just an amazing time, not only because of the holiday season, but also just bonding over the music. Um, additionally, I also went to Dogwood, and uh, during uh, their dinner, I would uh, play, I play the saxophone, so I would play for them. Uh, during their dinner, provide them with a little bit of entertainment during that. Um, and again, this happened from the months of November uh, through, through mid-December.
Um, moving forward, uh, as I said, I am still working with Step VA. Uh, in the end, I plan, and next year I do plan to go to Virginia Tech to study uh, in the School of Neuroscience. Um, this project has been a very big stepping stone in my understanding of the brain and psychology and the neuroscience um, behind all of this stuff. And I am incredibly excited to see where my, mu my understanding of not only the brain, but also my understanding of how the brain interacts with music can take me forward in my career. Um, my advice to um, governor school seniors that will soon be doing their projects, um, expect the unexpected. Many things will happen during your project that you will not expect to happen. You might have a plan and you could have it planned down to the last second, every last minute detail scheduled, but something could come in and completely alter your entire plan in an instant, and then you have to start over. You have to be prepared to be flexible and be prepared to deal with things that might not be exactly favorable to your situation. Um, I, I would like to give um, a very big thank you to numerous people. The first is my uh, mentor, Sarah Garner. She, I could not have done this project without her. Um, and same with Gail Collier, both of them uh, have been incredibly accommodating. I have a very busy schedule. Um, and I've also just had a lot of things happen in my personal life throughout this experience. Um, and they have both been incredibly kind and incredibly accommodating uh, throughout those events. Um, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Outen, Ms. Herndon, Ms. Carlton, who's not here. Um, they have provided an immense amount of support to me um, throughout this project, especially when things happened that were not necessarily to my control. Um, they helped me stay reasonable and navigate through some really difficult times that were, again, out of my control, but associated with this project. Um, any questions? Yes. You mentioned you had to undergo uh, sensory training. Uh, can mm -hmm. you speak a little bit more to that? What, what is that? What yeah. did you have to do? Um, so I went, I just had like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the director of Step VA. Um, her name is uh, Jan Monroe. Uh, she sat me down, uh, ran through a lot of the common uh, like sensory issues and disabilities that they see. So autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, things like that. Um, specifically, like what uh, problems are associated with uh, those disabilities and those issues and how to combat some of the more negative effects of that, whether that be with uh, fidget toys or other sensory uh, sensory items. Um, I came across that in my research. Um, by the time I had gotten to it, I was already focusing on um, mostly on other topics at that point, but I did uh, read some information on it in my research. Jackson? I'm curious, kind of related to talking about the outreach project, in the, in the research was there any specific type of research that you think would provide more benefit or more happen in the next Um, if you're... Uh, like genre or anything like that. I did not come across anything specific. Um, but when the listening, like when music, when it is active listening that an individual is doing, that is incredibly um, helpful in comparison to passive listening to music. And when an individual is actually involved with, like, with making that music, whether that be singing, playing an instrument, doing anything like that, that also um, leads to an increase in benefits.
Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison. Um, how are you guys doing today? Good? Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to be talking about the implementation of interactive science education. The reason that I chose this topic is because I've always been fascinated by science, and I kind of wanted to revisit where my passion started, which is at school. And a really big disparity I noticed is that after COVID, we kind of stopped doing labs. We stopped interacting with science. And science is a subject that you need to interact with to learn about. So through my research, I discovered that there isn't a lot of sources about this, specifically having to do with science. Although there's a lot of information about interactive education in general, there isn't a lot of information about science education. So. Um, one person that I talked to that was really insightful was Miss or Professor Floyd, who works here at Orange County High School. I interviewed her, and she gave me a lot of insight on maybe something that I could look towards while researching things for the project. One thing that she pointed at was games and how there's a lack of interactive games in the classroom at times. Things like, I don't know, Kahoot or GimKit. You guys like Kahoot and GimKit, right? They're fun, and they help you learn. And um, another thing that I discovered on my own is that we don't have a lot of labs. And then the third thing that I discovered was that going on museum trips and going and interacting with science outside of school can be useful too. Um, I believe there's a increase in like understanding or um, interaction with curriculum by about 10% when those students go visit um, these outside of school um, interactions. So my internship was done with Miss Catherine White here at Orange County High School. I went into her fourth block biology one class and um, I would administer labs to these students. And it was a really interesting experience because I didn't really learn what I thought I was going to. So I thought going in there, I was gonna learn how to administer labs and that was basically all I was gonna do. Miss White taught me more than that, and I learned more than that. Um, Miss White taught me how to talk to the class, how to not be so scared, you know, talking to 10th graders. They're a rowdy group and it's intimidating. But um, she taught me how to interact with them in a way that was appropriate and functional. And then what I learned myself was that students need, some students need special help. Some students need to be they need a specific way um, for something to be explained to them, something that's meaningful to them that relates to their life. I think a lot of students struggle when they feel like something doesn't apply to them or doesn't relate to them, and so they stop caring. And I noticed that with that class. So when I would talk to them, I would try to make it relate to their lives and build relationships with them personally. And I think that was an experience I wasn't expecting, but I got. And it was very valuable um, when going into my community service. Um, here's me talking to two students in the class, and I believe this is the penny drop experiment that we did with them. And we had a lot of good conversations. It was a really, really good experience for me. Um, for my community service, I worked with um, Mr. James Miller. I did around, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, I did, I forgot how many hours I did, I'm sorry. But um, I worked with Mr. James Miller at Boys and Girls Club. Uh, with Cyrus Roldan. He was my partner for this project. And we were both interested in getting students more involved with science, um, mine through interactive education. And um, we would come in once or twice a week, and, unless we were busy and our schedules didn't accommodate to that, and give the students um, a fun and interactive science experiment to work with. So in this picture over here to the right, I'm doing an oobleck experiment with students. Me and this girl are talking about non-Newtonian solutions. And this experience is, the interactive experience is really important for them. 
Um, and they would express to me, like when I would ask them questions, they would say something like, oh, I had fun today. Or um, they, I would say, well, what did you learn today? And they could always tell me. They would always be able to tell me something that they learned today. And that to me showed me how valuable this experience really was um, for them and for me too. I learned a lot. I learned that my internship, the what I got from my internship, which is making stuff meaningful for students, does really truly apply to this as well. Getting them involved was so exciting. Like seeing them excited by science was like by far the best part of this experience because that's what I came in there to do. I wanted to excite them. I wanted to use interactive science to get them involved, to get them enjoying the subject and hopefully um, fuel a future where they, they um, enjoy or maybe even want a career or are interested in it in high school and middle school too. Um, both of these experiences tied together very nicely, which is another thing I was surprised by because obviously high school labs are very different from a lab that you would administer to an elementary school student. Um, I was able to apply education, science education in both of these respects in an interactive way. Bless you. This picture over here to the right is actually me reviewing, doing SOL review with those students. And they, they were responding. Like they were able to answer the questions at the beginning of the year. Like I would ask them a question, they would just be like, I don't know. Here, their response was, they could give me an answer. A, B, C, or D, they had it. It was great. Um, over here, here's the students. They, I mean, they're leaning over the table. They got their spoons on and we were making slime here. Um, and it was, it was just a really great learning experience in both of those respects. Um, as for my personal future, I'm planning to attend Virginia Tech to study neuroscience. And um, I'm obviously applying science to my career. Um, I want to thank uh, many people. I want to thank um, Ms. Catherine White for allowing me to come into her classroom and interact with her students. Um, I want to thank I want to thank James Miller for allowing me to come into Boys and Girls Club and um, work with his students as well, second grade, third grade, first grade, and kindergarten students. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Floyd for giving me all the information she's given me throughout her time, you know, here, and her support as well. I want to thank Cyrus Roldan for all of his support throughout this experience. Honestly, like he helped me set up so much stuff. I don't think I would have been able to do that alone. And I want to thank Ms. Herndon and Ms. Carlton for all of their support throughout this project. That meant a lot. Um, and it was nice to have someone to talk to. Um, thank you guys for listening. And any questions? Um, so for my internship, I did that from August to December, it was really prolonged um, because there's, we don't do a lot of labs at school, so have to accommodate to that. And um, for my community service, that was between the months of October and November. Uh, yes. Um, I'm not really sure what I want to do with my degree. I would. I think I'd prefer to do research, but education is something that I've considered as well. Um, and this project was really what made me consider it. Jackson? So what thoughts would you like on how specifically the BOBTS takes biocache and food science? Because I, I remember that in CAS from my recollection, it had a lot of math in it, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that that class is only available to certain students here. So availability is a really big issue with that. I mean, you can sign up maybe online to take AP Bio through the school, but you don't get that in-person experience. It's not going to have labs online. Um, AP Bio is, as far as I know, only for governor's school students. But I do think it's a great opportunity for governor's school students, yes. Johan? Oh, yes. <laughs> OK, so for future BRVGS students, I would say, um, really, yeah, seriously, pick a topic you're passionate about. Like, I know that's been regurgitated to you multiple times, but seriously, pick a topic you care about. Like, this project probably would have been significantly more difficult for me had I not picked science as my topic. So yeah, pick something you're seriously passionate about and don't um, get on top of it. Like, 
do it while it's fresh. Don't don't wait a long time to do it because you're gonna you're gonna feel the effect of that. <laughs> Hello, my name is Timothy Rivera. My, my project was on increasing access to culinary education. So ever since I've grown up, I've been around people who are involved in baking and cooking. Both my parents graduated from culinary school with an associate's degree. So I've always been inspired to kind of be interested in baking and cooking. It's something that I can do to show my appreciation for other people. And I feel like a lot of people don't get to explore that area. It, in high school, I was expecting to have some kind of extracurricular, some kind of class where I could explore cooking and baking. And we have classes like home ec, but there's, there's not enough focus on culinary education as a whole. So obviously this isn't me doing actual research, but for my research, my question was, how, how is culinary education the best method for improving student preparedness for independent living? And so through that, I looked at the ideas where culinary education helps enrich people through giving them more skills, more assets to provide for themselves. It also improves their diet. They, they know how to eat healthy, so they're going to choose to eat healthy, and they know how to prepare for themselves. And it also increases the amount of job opportunities that you have. And that's where my internship kind of led to because I interned at the Lake of the Woods Clubhouse. The Lake of the Woods Clubhouse is a local restaurant in the Locust Grove community. They do both buffets, plated events, and dinner service, so I felt like it would give me the best experience of working in a restaurant, allowing me to explore whether or not that was something I wanted to do in my future, which is something that a lot of people don't get the option to do. This was my mentor for both parts of my project. His name is Nathan Pacifico, and he's the executive chef at the Lake of the Woods Clubhouse. I basically shadowed slash assisted him in everything that he did during the two weeks that I went there for the summer. I did 22 hours of my internship, and basically I would go through, I would prepare things, I would cut fruits and vegetables, just the basic kinds of um, knife cutting techniques and knife handling skills that you would need to prepare food for yourself. And I feel like this is important to learn because how else are you going to make food for yourself, right? And then another thing that I worked on was maintenance, maintenance of the kitchen. So if you're going to work in a kitchen, you're going to be making food. The food has to be clean. So you want to make sure your floors are clean. You want to make sure the machinery is clean. Um, but I also am maintaining the food in proper temperatures. So you don't want your raw meat to be sitting in unsafe temperatures or it's gonna be spoiled. You're not gonna eat healthy food. And I feel like this is another thing that people don't understand. People don't understand proper food storage, proper food handling. And because of that, they risk being sick. Last thing I worked in was serving. Serving food, I would 
take food to tables. I would talk to people. I would communicate with the ex or with the front of the house to make sure that food got where it needed to be. And I feel like this is also important because communication is something that we're all going to use in our lives. And knowing that this is something that you'd have to do in a restaurant, whether you're working front of the house, back of the house, it doesn't matter, is important. For my community service, I did instructional videos. So these videos were basically, um, I shared my recipes, I recorded them, and I put them on my Blue Ridge website, as well as my uh, Blue Ridge account on YouTube, that are these videos are accessible by anyone. And it basically, they're very easy recipes. The point of them is to just get the idea that people, anyone can bake, anyone can cook, and just by following through these videos, you can do the same exact thing. And so I made chocolate chip cookies, and in that instant pot is buffalo chicken dip. Uh, before I say thank you, I would like to say that I think my community service, I think I could have worked on my community service by making it an interactive classroom rather than videos. I think that would improve student interaction, and I'd actually be able to see how people were impacted by my community service. I think I would recommend that for future Blue Ridge students trying to do these projects, that you should really start as soon as possible, not only because of issues with procrastination or like worrying about finishing your project on time, but by starting early, you also get more time to experience what you're doing. You actually get to grow from the experience rather than just trying to rush through it to get the project done. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to Nathan Pacifico for mentoring both of my project or both of my internship and my community service. And thank you to my advisors for supporting me and helping me through this project. Questions? I plan on going to VCU for forensic science. I know that's not anything to do with the culinary industry, but. I figure, I think that by doing, <laughs> by doing this internship and knowing that working in the kitchen is something that I enjoy, I at least have a career opportunity that I can pursue while I'm pursuing my degree, something that I enjoy. Sadie? Well, that's, that's part of the problem is that people can't provide for themselves. People don't know how to provide for themselves. And there's also the problem of what if, what if you wanted to go to culinary school? You wouldn't know because there was no opportunity to explore that career during your earlier years. Skyler? Overall, I put about 10 hours into the videos, just recording and editing and doing voiceovers for everything. Uh, my biggest learning curve was probably understanding that nothing, nothing that you're gonna do during your internship and community service is gonna be perfect. Like you're going into this thing without any knowledge on the topic, or maybe you do have a little knowledge, but like when, I'm, when I was at my internship cutting food, like I, I wanted to cut it perfectly. I wanted it to look nice, but that's not going to happen on my first try, and that was that was hard to understand. But yes, <laughs> I had not I have not checked the account for subscribers.